a little bit. Um, see if we can go back to some things we may be able to agree on. All right, sir. All right. Uh, first thing is, is that the money you were stealing in addition to your income and the money you were borrowing was not just to pay for drugs. Would you agree with that? Sure. All right. And would you agree that your stealing, in addition to the money you were borrowing, increased over the years as we moved towards June of 2021? Repeat that, please, sir. Sure. Would you agree that your stealing increased over the years as we moved towards June of 2021? Yes, sir. And would you admit that your stealing increased, in particular, after the boat wreck? Uh, no, sir. I, I don't agree with that. You don't agree with that? I, I think I continued to do it, but I, I, I don't... As I sit here today, I, I, I don't think I took more money that I should not have taken after the boat wreck than I did before the boat wreck. Okay. But again, the, the, those documents speak for themselves, Mr. Waters, and if yes. that's the case, then that's the case. But as we sit here, I, I, I think that I probably wrongly took from clients and people that trusted me more, as much money before that boat wreck as after. And I'm just, trying, I'm just trying to get through this so we don't get bogged down like we did yesterday, all right? Uh, I understand. All right. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't agree with me that in 2019 alone you stole about $3.7 million? No, I, th I think that's correct. All right. And you would, would you agree with me, though, that that figure in 2019 was generally higher than any other year that you've been stealing since 2011? In any year, sure, I'd agree with that. Okay. I thought you were talking about overall, the whole, you know, the whole cycle. But right. yeah, I, I, I would agree that in 2019, I stole more money than any other year. Would you agree with me that from 2015 on, your legitimate income, while still very strong, was diminishing as a general matter? Well, I think whatever my income is speaks for itself. But as a general rule, a plaintiff's lawyer doing what we do, income ebbs and flows. Some You have some really good years. You have some really lean years. And no, I, 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 think, I, had some, I think I had some good years. Maybe not the, you know, four and five million dollar years, but I think I had some two and three million dollar years in there. And... And my caseload was such that, you know, I had one of the things I was working on that Monday was one of the biggest cases that I've ever been involved in. You're talking and, about the Dominion case, right? Yes, sir. Right. And so, you know, I, I think it was cyclical. I think it – so I don't I – don't, without looking at the record specifically, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't necessarily agree with that. Okay. So you don't remember then? No, I do remember. I, I, I don't think I agree with that. But again, those records will speak for themselves. Um, okay. All right. So would you agree with me that in 2014 uh, your reported income was over a million dollars? Objection is overruled. Re reported income like mm -hmm. tax-wise or reported yeah. – I assume you have a document that says that, and if you're reading that from a document, I don't dispute it. I mean, I'm happy to show it to you if you like. I trust you, Mr. Waters. So. All, right. All right, I appreciate that. All right, 2015, uh, would you agree that your reported income was over $2 million? Again, I, I, I don't dispute that. All right. 2016, reported income, $900,000. Okay. 2017, reported income, $218,000. Okay. 2018 reported income of $749,000, roughly. Okay. And 2019 reported income of $655,000. Okay. And see, that, that, I mean, to me, that demonstrates exactly what I'm talking about, how 
it goes up and down. And would you agree with me that though during those periods of time where you were making that kind of money, you continued to steal, and I think you've already said that your stealing increased as we move through those years as a general matter? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't dispute, and I, I have never disputed since I was confronted on Labor Day weekend right. that I took money from my clients. We, we've gone through that. And well, I think but you keep asking that. me I'm about asking that. you if, it, if, it, you're, it, if you're income. Uh, you finish your answer. So the, the, the point is, is I have never since being confronted that day my brother and my partner came to talk to me that I have stolen money that did not belong to me, that I misled people to do it, people that I cared about, still care about, um, a lot of them that I love and still love. And I misled them to do it, and I was wrong. I, I have never disputed that from day one. I, and I, we've been through that. All I'm trying to establish right now with you, Mr. Murdoch, is as we move towards June of 2021, what your con financial condition was like, okay? I've, I agree you've testified to that multiple times, all right? So let me ask you this. During this time that your income was what we just went through and you conceded that your stealing was increasing, were you also borrowing significant amount of money from Palmetto State Bank? Uh, yes, I'd always borrowed significant amount of money from Palmetto State Bank, or, or for the last more than the last decade. Right. So, yes, sir, I agree with that. Yeah, we, as we move to June of 2021, did you have a million-dollar line of credit with the bank that was pretty much maxed out? Yes or no? In in as we move to June of 2021. So in June of 21? Sure. Yes. All right. And did you also have a $600,000 line of credit that was pretty much maxed out around that time? I did. All right. And did you also, over the years, repeatedly borrow six figures from your law partners? Well, I borrowed money from a law partner. Which one? Johnny Parker. Johnny Parker. Okay. And... That was a fairly common occurrence over the years. It happened multiple times. Would you agree with that? I agree that it happened multiple times. I mean. All right. And you would agree also that you would sometimes use some of the stolen money to pay that back? I, I, I won't dispute that. I don't know that that's the case. I, I know what I saw Mr. Um, Bernie testify to in using that particular accounting method you know, I, I see that. All right. So I, 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 I don't dispute that. All right. And would you agree that you also, when you needed money, occasionally borrow as much as five and six figures from your father, Mr. Randolph? I did. All right. And would you also agree that over the years, particularly as we moved to June of 2021, you would use stolen money to pay that back? I don't dispute that. Okay. If, if that's what the record shows. <laughs> All right, and you, you just mentioned here in the testimony of Carson Burney and the banker and all that, you would agree with me that as we move to June of 2021, at least in liquid funds, you were running out of money. In liquid funds is in money on hand or money that I could get? Money that you could, liquid funds. You're a lawyer, you know what liquid means. Where are you well, running I, out I don't know what you mean by liquid, okay. Mr. Waters, and so. Money you could readily access assets that you could readily access to pay your ever-increasing debts. No, sir, I don't agree with that. You don't agree with that? I do not agree with okay. that, and I'll tell you why. All right. In, in, so are, are we talking about June? I'm talking about as we move to June. Okay, but what time period are you talking about? All right, let's talk about January From, to June. Okay, January to June. January to June, you know, I could borrow money from my father. Mm -hmm. I could borrow money from Johnny Parker. Mm -hmm. I could go to the bank and borrow money. Mm -hmm. uh, I had substantial equity in the Edisto house, right. as we've talked about. Which was in Maggie's name, correct? Well, it was in Maggie and my name. All right. 
So, you know, that definitely um, was, was in, in both of our names. Moselle was in Maggie's name. There was substantial equity in that that could have been barred against. So under the, under the terms as you defined liquid assets just now, money that I would have access to, I disagree with okay. on that uh, uh, for those reasons that I just said. Can we at least agree that generally the way the compensation structure for legitimate money that you earned in your law firm, the vast majority of your compensation does not come except in one lump sum in December? Can we agree to that? Right. We get a salary. We, we would receive a salary. I believe our salary was $125,000. Right. And then the income that was earned would be paid in the form of a bonus at the year end. All right. And then would you agree with me? that that is why you stole the Ferris fees in March of 2021 because you were in desperate need of funds and you could not wait till December to access those funds. I think there's probably a lot of reasons why I stole those funds, but I certainly would believe or, or don't dispute that that's one of the reasons. And would you agree with me that the $792,000 that you stole of those Ferris funds that you exhausted those within about two months? I don't know the time period, but I know that they, I know that I exhausted them. All right. Now, again, I'm trying to get through this quickly because there's a lot more to talk about, obviously. But we went through a number of questions yesterday about the various clients that you stole from, correct? You remember that? Those cut the back and forth we had yesterday. Do you remember all that? Sure, I do. Okay. All right. And so I'm going to try to shortchange this, but I think it's important that we at least say the names of the people that were involved. But let's just do this to see if we can. To the comment, Your Honor, inappropriate. I'll rephrase, Your Honor. The clients that we're talking about, these are all real people, yes or no? They're all real people. All right. They're and all good clients? people. Okay. They're all people that I care about, that I cared about then. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them are people that I love. Okay. And I did wrong by them. Yes, you hurt the people that you love, I know. So... <clears throat> This time. These were all people, every single one of them, that you at least had a personal conversation with at some point during the course of your representation. All of my clients? representation. Absolutely. I, I had multiple conversations with all of my clients. And these were people, every single one of them, real people that you looked in the eye and convinced them that everything was right. Yes, when, Your Honor. 403, repetitive, cumulative. We spent two hours doing this yesterday. I'm just trying to sort of change the topic with uh, the simple questions that applies to everybody, and then I'm moving on. Proceed. I, I would have had conversations with all of my clients, and at some of the conversations would have been on the telephone. I would have had conversations where I might not be looking them in the eye. I would have had plenty of conversations where I did look them in the eye. All right. Every single one of them looked them in the eye at least once. Is that fair? Sure. Every single one of them... You looked them in the eye and developed their trust in you. Is that true? Every client that I had, at some point, I, I looked them in the eye, and I believed that I had the trust of my clients. Whether that came from me looking them in the eye or not, I can't answer that, but I will agree with you that every single client, I looked them in the eye, and I believe that the people that I stole money from for all those years trusted me. And I'm going to show you what's been previously admitted as states 329, I believe it is, and 314. And I'm just going to ask you to peruse those spreadsheets really quickly. And what you have to do that, let me know. I'll have one or two questions about that.
All right, so I'm sorry. What was your question? I just asked you to look at them. Have you had a chance to review those documents? I have. All right. And would you agree with me that every single name on here are either clients that trusted you that you stole from or instances in which you stole from your law partners who trusted you as well? I agree with that. All right. So we don't need to go through each, each one of these, correct? I agree. Mr. Waters, like I've told you, I'll go through whatever you want to go through, but each one of those clients is just what we've already talked about. Good people, fine people, upstanding people, they trusted me. Every single one of them I did and I do still care about, and many of them I love and consider them close friends. Like Barry Bulware? Absolutely. It's a perfect example. And you stole from Barry Bulware? I did. Do you recall a conversation that you had with Ronnie Crosby in which he told you that Barrett was desperate for money because he needed his wife to stay in a hotel near him while he was undergoing treatment for terminal cancer around the time that you stole from him? Hey, you're on. Objections overruled. I don't recall that conversation, but you know, I, I knew Barrett was sick. You know, Barrett is a unique situation. I mean, Barrett, Barrett is and was um, dear to me as a friend. But I mean, Barrett and I had a long, long history. You know. I guess really, and I lied probably more by omission, lies by omission in stealing that money. Um, but that's a perfect example. You keep asking about me having these conversations and looking people in the eye. I mean, that's a perfect example. I mean, when I stole that money, he was nowhere around. It was more based on lies by omission. And, and Barrett and I had such a history these real estate deals that you're asking me about, Barrett was one of my good friends, and we had been in these real estate deals together. Barrett was just an interesting person. He was a shrimper. He was born and raised in Allendale County, and and he moved down to the coast. And Mr. Murdoch, as shrimping, Mr. Murdoch, I, I don't well, know that we need Barrett's entire life story. No, I, but it's it's important well, to understand this based this. on the question you asked. I don't think his entire life story is responsible, Your Honor. And I'm not intending to give his life story. I'm just telling you a little background. Go so ahead. Tell us about it. your friend that you stole from. That's fine. So Barrett started started getting into real estate, and he was really good at it. And and so I started getting involved with him in that. He could go out and find pieces of property that were really cheap, get them and sell them, and and, and make money. Well, we got in some of these deals, and we got in as Barrett and it was some other people. Well. When the recession hit, one of the reasons these land deals caused me trouble is because the people that I was in these deals with no longer could pay, Where, whereas I might have gone in and I was a 20% person. I'm now all of a sudden, either I have to default at the bank and, and, and affect credit, affect ability to borrow, or I have to pay 100%. And so that's what I did. I paid 100%. And so there were years where I was paying instead of a fifth or a half, I'm paying the whole thing. And it equated to hundreds of thousands, it equated to millions of dollars, which is one of the ways why I ended up with the Moselle property, because I had paid more than a million dollars in monies for, for, for Barrett, and that was part of the, tr the deal and the trade in, in me purchasing Moselle. So what you're and telling me is you felt like you were entitled to steal from him. No, no. Uh, you know what? I, 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 I will t tell you this, that, you know, when you're doing the things wrong that I was doing, you have all kind of ways of justifying it. And, and, and I'm not saying that that makes it right by any means because it's not. It's wrong. I've said that a hundred times. But when I was doing it and I was as addicted as I was, 
and the things I was doing, there's all kind of things that you, you know, to, to be able to look yourself in the mirror, uh, you lie to yourself. And you, you, I guess self-justification for these bad things, you know, I guess is what I was doing. But, you know, Barrett had owed me so much money that when I took his money, I, I just didn't tell him. So it, it, was, it was a lie by omission. All right. All these people on these two exhibits, these were real people that needed this money. Is that correct? I'm sure they did. But it was more important to you that you stole their money on top of the 40% of legal fees that you were taking. Repetitive. I've never I asked that question. I stole their money. It was more important to you than their needs. Is that correct? Objection. Objections are ruled. I don't remember sitting down and calculating, okay, is this more important? You know, one of the self-justifications that I talked about, Mr. Waters, is, and, and this is one of the things, again, I want to make it clear. I, I don't, as I sit here today, I do not believe that any of this justifications that I'm talking about made any of this okay, because I don't. I've, I've owned up to all this money I stole. I've tried to since I was confronted, and I continue here today. But one of the justifications at the time when I was taking pills and doing the things I was doing was, I may ask a partner, okay, how much is this case worth? And if, if, if one of my partners, and I may not even give them all the real facts, okay? So if they said this case is worth $100,000, okay, and I go out and I get them $300,000, you know, that's one of the st stupid little things. Okay, well, this isn't the same. And that's one of those justifications that I used in looking back on this that I don't know how I did. But so to sit down and say, did I evaluate that they needed the money more than I did? I, I, you know, I don't think I did that. I think I was selfish, and I, I, I think I just took the money. Okay. I think I understand. Um, I asked you a series of questions yesterday about at least relating one conversation you had with one of these clients. And I'm just going to ask you this one. Do you remember looking Tony Satterfield in the eye and lying to him? I remember lying to Tony Satterfield, and I remember looking him in the eye on many occasions. And lying to him? Yeah. Okay. Lying to his family? I lied to his family. I don't know if I did it in person. But I know I had phone conversations with him where I lied to him. Okay. Let's talk a little bit uh, about the pills, if we can. Okay. Um, and you've already testified, as have other people, that you were still able to function as a lawyer over the years despite the pills that you were using. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And. You were able, of course, during this period of time to engage in these relatively complicated thefts that increased over the years that we've just talked about, despite the pill usage. Is that correct? I was. Hmm? I was. All right. And you were also able to, during this time period, convince your staff that nothing was amiss with all of these exhibits, despite your pill usage? I mean, most of those didn't require m convincing my staff, but just so we're on the same page again, I acknowledge that I certainly allowed them to be misled. I certainly allowed them to do things that I shouldn't have done on my behalf, knowing that they trusted me. 
How many uh, how many pills were you using a day? Depends on um, a number of items. Most most importantly, how strong the pill was. Okay. Well, let's let's talk about. Let's say start maybe in January of 2021 and move forward. Can you describe to the jury what your daily pill intake was like? I think at that time, most of what I was purchasing was 30 uh, milligram pills, um, instant release, oxycodone. Um, they were probably mixed in with some oxycontin, which is made of oxycodone. It's just time release. Um, I would have been taking Um, anywhere from fifteen uh, hundred milligrams, maybe, to um, maybe maybe a, a, a thousand or, or maybe a thousand milligrams of or, or 1,200 milligrams on a day I didn't take as much or didn't have as much up to, I mean, there are days, many days, a lot of days, most days were more than that, and many days would be, you know, 20, more than 2,000 milligrams a day. And how many pills is that? It, it depends on the strength mm -hmm. well, let's say it's the of 30s the pill. That you just mentioned. If I took 30, if, if, if I had 30 milligram pills, you, you figure 100 pills would be 3,000 milligrams. 100? 100. 100. So you're taking 60 a day or something like that? I mean, there I were days where I took more than that. There were days I took less than that. And how would you take them during the course of the day? I mean, how many are you taking at one time? How frequent in this time period, let's say January to June? You know, there's a point in time, and I'm not sure when it was. I think it was well before that where, and you have to understand this. This is something that I didn't, I mean, I can still remember the first time I ever took an oxy. Mr. Murdoch, can I ask you to answer my question, and I'll let you explain all you want. And my question was, I'm, how many were you taking a day during this time from January to June. Answer that first, please, and if you want to explain, I'm happy to let you do so. I'm not positive, and here's why. It's because over the years, like the, as I was saying, the first OxyContin, one OxyContin made me, literally made me sick. Um, and that was when I was transitioning from hydrocodone to oxycodone. And it, it made me sick because it was a really, really, really strong one. And so, you know, one OxyContin pill was like, 10 hydrocodone pills. So, but anyway, as I took more and more, and over the years, it just, you know, you build up a tolerance to pain pills. And so what might give me this energy, what, the, the reason, one of the reasons I became so addicted is, you know, some people talk about pain pills and how they make them lethargic and, you know, where they can't do anything and they feel, Opiates gave me energy. I mean, I, it, it, whatever I was doing, it made it more interesting. You know, it, it, it made me want to do it longer. Uh, you know, to go on a drive, it made driving, it just, it, it just at the beginning, it made everything better. But I, I took so much just to keep, it got to a point where I was taking so much just to not, backslide or go into withdrawals or have all those symptoms and so it, it got to the point where I was taking the amounts that I came to be taken in the time period you're talking about January to June so it, it, it evolved over time it, it, it wasn't like it just started then Mr. Waters right, can you just give me one one example of a day during that time period I mean, sure I mean, so I mean did you take start at 8 o'clock in the morning or, you, or whatever time you got up and take one and then one every 30 minutes I mean well, no, uh, it I, I've would, given you a chance to explain so it now would totally depend it, it, it would totally depend on 
any number of circumstances. So in, starting a day, one of the main things that this would depend on was how late the day before I had taken pills and how many I had taken. And did I take them during the night? Did I wake up during the night and take them? So, you know, let's just say that it had been a while since I took any and I slept and I woke up, all right? Then I would immediately, immediately, first thing, take pills because if it's been a while, a lot of times if you slept and hadn't taken pills, you'd wake up and you could tell the beginnings of those, I'm not going to say they were really withdrawals, but the agitation that you feel when you don't take it, and you could tell it, so you had to take it right away. And so I would start off, first thing I would do would take pills. Um. And that's how strong the withdrawals are for opiates, correct? That you feel that agitation until you can take another pill. It, yes, I mean, but that, I mean, that's just agitation's the tip of the iceberg um, when Let's it talk about that comes to withdrawals, sure. opiate withdrawals. I think you, you said in your what's been played for the jury and uh, the telephone conversation with Special Agent Kelly that. And you talked about withdrawals, just how strong they are, how you're willing to do anything to make them stop, correct? I think what I said is almost anything. Almost anything. Well, describe that, please. I mean, you're sick. I mean, you're physically, you know, you are physically sick. You, um, it's like having the flu when you ache and your joints hurt. Um, you, you don't want to get up. I mean, you can't get up. And, and, and that's after a while. Uh, it, it starts with what you're talking about, agitation. And, uh, you know, fidgety. Everybody talks about how fidgety I was. Um, but it, 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 it starts with, with that, and then it goes to, you know, you just, you might be sitting here and just all of a sudden sweats running down your face all over your body. I mean, you so, like you ran a marathon. I mean, you literally sweat that much. Um, the next thing that comes on after about, uh, I don't know, 12 hours is, I call it jumpy legs, but I mean, you literally, I mean, you, you there, there's no way that you could sit right here in this chair. I mean, you, you, you couldn't. You, you couldn't remain sitting. I mean, you would have to get up and move around. And I mean, it's like your legs don't want to work. Um, and that lasts for about 20, anywhere from 18 to 24 hours. Um, during, during that period, the, uh, you know, the intestinal issues come in. And I mean, you literally, you can't control yourself. You have I mean, diarrhea like you have food poisoning. Um, you throw up. Um, I mean, you're physically, physically sick. How many times did you try to self-detox? Mr. Waters? Dozens, dozens. If not hundreds, I, I, you know, it's so many I, I can't tell you. And those those symptoms you just described are extremely powerful, and made it very difficult to do that. Is that correct? Made it difficult to to try to self detox. Oh, it's, it's, it's extremely hard. You mentioned yesterday uh, that you were paranoid. How long had that been going on? Well, no, I, I didn't say that I was paranoid. What I said was, as the addiction evolved, there would be situations where you would have these paranoid thoughts. And when and did those first start? I can't tell you when they first started, but... I mean, how long before June of 2021? Oh, a long week, time. A week, a month, a long time? Oh, no, time. no, 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 no. It was, you know, it was... 
as my addiction got worse. I mean, it, it was a significant period of time. But, you know. How often do we, we have these paranoid thoughts? I, I, usually a matter of seconds. I mean, it, it was something. Again, my whole life, you, you wouldn't see me where I didn't have pills on me. And, and I, that's where I kept them. I kept them on me because I, I was scared to put them somewhere for fear somebody would find them. So I kept them on me. So if you saw me, I had pills on me. I had a pocket full of pills on June the 8th, on June the 8th when, when I was sitting in, in uh, David Owen's patrol car. Um, so I always had them on me. And... I might turn, I might be going to Edisto, and I turn on Hampton Street right out here, and a police car pulls out. Boom. I have paranoid thoughts. You know, it just, but I could always say, you're not doing, you're not doing anything wrong. He's not following you, and I, I can get past it, and a matter of seconds. <clears throat> Did anybody in your family ever see you having these severe withdrawals? Absolutely. And who did? Mags, Papa, Bus, my dad, Randy, John Marvin. And just to be clear, Randy and John Marvin never saw me having withdrawals before September. They so saw who, me. And I thank you for clarifying that. Prior to June of 2021, who in your family saw you having these severe withdrawals? Bus, Papa, Maggie, my dad. Do you uh, remember in uh, calling? Remember calling Paul a little detective? I don't know that I ever called him a little detective, but I think Maggie did. I, I may have. I mean, Paul was very intuitive. So I heard I Miriam. I heard your interviews. I heard Miriam call him a little detective. I know Maggie used to call him that. Did that have anything to do with the pills? Um, well, yeah, yeah, it had something to do with it, but I mean, Paul was always that way, but that, that what led him to be called a little detective, certainly there were times when, when, um, Paul found pills. Including just a month before the murders, is that correct? No, sir. Okay. You recall 6-5? 23, that was entered into evidence, which is a text from Paul to you. I did. Which he said that Maggie found pills in your bag. Right. Tell me about what but happened I, after that. You asked me about Paul finding them, but it was Maggie that found them. Fair enough. So it was Maggie that found them? Yes, sir. Okay. But Paul is the one who reached out to you, correct? On that occasion, yes, sir. Right. And what was the discussion after that? I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was about that I'd had eye surgery the, um, I don't know what day it was, but days before that, the day Maggie found them, Maggie drove me to the doctor for me to have my cataract um, um, removed, whatever, late, whatever they call that surgery, I can't remember, but I had a cataract taken out, an outpatient. You go in for a couple hours and you come out. And it was during COVID, and so Maggie wasn't allowed to come into the doctor's office, and so she sat in the car. And I had left pills in the computer bag and sitting out there bored, I guess she started looking at my computer and found them in the computer bag. So she found 
um, those pills. All right. And so she obviously told Paul, and Paul texted you, correct, about finding those pills? That's correct. In May of 2021? That's correct. And you've heard your sister-in-law, Marion, testify that Maggie called him the little detective about the pills. You heard that testimony in this courtroom? I did hear that. All right. So did they start to watch you like a hawk and get on you about your pill usage during the month of May? No. They did not? No. Mr. Waters, this battle that I had with addiction, it had been going on for years, years. And so they had been watching me like a hawk for years um, before May. May was just one occurrence where I let them down again. They had been watching you like a hawk for years, is that correct? About my pill addiction, yes, sir. That is correct. Uh, this time in May, that wasn't the only time that Paul found pills or Maggie found pills. Is that correct? Now, there were a number of times where Mags found pills, Paul Paul found pills, Bus found pills. I mean, it was an ongoing, it was just an ongoing battle for me. And after they found those pills in May, that being Maggie and Paul, were they trying to get you to self-detox? No, sir. Not at that point in time. They just let it go? No, they didn't let it go. But at that point in time, Paul Paul and I had already had a discussion based on... Um, I can't remember exactly when it was, but there had been a previous occasion a good while back where there had been a previous occasion where either Maggie or Paul had found pills, and Paul had come to me and asked me and I told him, you know, I was back on the pills. Um, and We had had a long talk. I, I, as I said, I don't remember exactly when it was before that. Paul and I had had a long talk. And we'd agreed, I, I'd agreed, and I detoxed so many times. I'd been to detox. I detoxed at home with Maggie's help. I detoxed at home with <coughs> doctor's help. I detoxed on my own, tried to. And, and it, it just... It just detoxing just didn't work. It just, you couldn't, you could detox, but you couldn't, no, not you, I couldn't. I couldn't stay off of them. And so, I promised Paul That as soon as his, as soon as we finished with his criminal case, that I would go to rehab. And um, and, and on this particular occasion, um, Paul knew that his mom 
worried about me so much with pills that on this particular occasion I think that Paul Paul convinced Maggie that I got those pills in anticipation of the eye surgery but that I never took them so that she would not worry that I was once again So you're talking about now you're claiming that about the time in May that, that Paul talked to Maggie and the minister of that or are you talking about a different time? I'm not claiming that Mr. Waters that's a fact this is what happened All right. we're, we're hearing that now correct? Hearing what now? What you just said well, you just asked me this. Mr. Ward, if you keep making an issue about the first time I, you hearing these things, when, when I got arrested and I went to jail, we began reaching out to you to talk to you about all of these things, to try to tell you everything that I had done, to give you all these details, to help you all go through these financial things. And up until the time that you all charged me with murdering my wife and child, you would never uh, give Jim Griffin a response to our invitations to sit down and meet with you. So you're so, telling me I never responded to Jim Griffin? Is that what you're saying here today? I'm telling you. Are you saying that you ever before yesterday reached out to anyone through yourself or through your attorneys and reached out to anyone in law enforcement or the prosecution and told them the story about the kennels? Are you telling me that? I'm, what I'm Did telling you, you Answer my Mr. question Waters? first, please, sir. Answer my question first. Did you ever reach out to anyone in law enforcement or the prosecution and tell that story that you told this jury yesterday about the kennels before yesterday? Did I ever reach out to law enforcement to say, I want to tell you about the kennels? No, sir, I did not. What this I is the Fifth Amendment line. Pardon? This questioning about him volunteering information on these charges violates his Fifth Amendment rights, and we strongly object. Any more would we have to make a motion? He brought it up. Objections overruled. What I did was so. Answer yep. my question first, sir. Yeah, for the record, he did not bring it. He was talking I'm about financial sit stuff. Down, Mr. Um, he was Griffin. Yes or no question. Before yesterday, did you ever bring up what you told this jury about that kennels? To anybody in the prosecution or anybody in law enforcement? No, I, I didn't have the opportunity to, Mr. Waters, because you would not respond to my invitations to reach out and tell you about all the things that I'd done wrong. And to talk about bringing this to a head, to talk about bringing this to closure. I understand how many people I hurt. I understand. Um, how angry my partners are and how hurt they are. And I understand how hurt these people that I stole money from are. I understand how hurt they are. And one of the things that I believe is getting past this may help them get some closure. And so since at least January, I've been trying to sit down with y'all to talk to y'all. Okay. And never, never ever got a response to the multiple requests. Multiple requests? Yes, sir. Multiple requests. I, I, I would ask about right, this let's, every uh, well, let's few ask weeks. This, sir. sir? Did Mark Ball ever hear your story to the jury about the kennels until yesterday? Your buddy and law partner, Mark Ball? No, sir, I haven't spoken to Mark Ball since I went to rehab. And these were the same law partners that you were listening to the night of. Is that is that what you testified to this jury earlier? You testified to that earlier, did you not? I, I don't understand your question. Didn't you testify earlier that you were listening to your law partners on the night of the incident? Did, was I listening to them? Yeah, you testified to that. It's a simple question, sir. I'm, I'm sure I was. It, when are you talking about? On June 8th, in the early morning hours. You testified to this jury that you were listening to them, but you never told them the Kendall story either. And they heard it for the first time yesterday as well. Isn't that correct? Y yes, that's the first time they heard it. First time 
that Ronnie Crosby ever heard that would have been yesterday? If he was listening, that would have been the first time he heard it. The first time Johnny Parker ever heard that was yesterday? Yes. First time Danny Henderson, who was representing you in the boat case, ever heard that was yesterday? Yes. Yesterday is the first time that I have said that openly. But that, that's not what you were asking me, Mr. Waters, but you, you go ahead. First time your brother Randy heard that was yesterday. <laughs> if he was listening. <clears throat> and Mr. Waters, just to be clear, I was begging for a meeting with y'all to try to bring this to a close, to, to talk to y'all about everything up until the time that y'all charged me with hurting Maggie and Paul. Now, at, after that point in time, uh, I, I stopped, You're obviously. You that you were begging for a meeting, and and you, but you admit information was never conveyed that you wanted to change your story after multiple interviews with law enforcement about what happened that night, including the most important fact of all, which is when the last time you supposedly saw your wife and son alive was. I don't know exactly what was conveyed or not because to you because I wasn't part of it. All I know Fair is enough. what you don't I was trying to do was to sit down. I understood to bring all this to a close that y'all would want me to sit down and go through all of these financial things, all of these things that I'd done wrong, and to try to bring that to a close, I was repeatedly trying to sit down with y'all. The reality is, Mr. Murdoch, is the reason why no one's ever heard that before is because you had to sit in this courtroom and hear your family and your friends, one after the other, come in and testify that you were on that kennel video. So you, like you've done so many times over the course of your life, had to back up and make a new story that kind of fit with the facts that can't be denied. Isn't that true, sir? No, sir, that's not true. Okay. You've done that over and over again over the years with all of this that we've been talking about, haven't you? I've done what over and over again? The second that you're confronted with facts that you can't deny, you immediately come up with a new lie. Isn't that correct? Mr. Waters, have we established I have lied many times, but I can't sit here and tell you that, what are you talking about, facts that I can't deny? That I, I, I would disagree with that proposition that you're putting out that that was what I did all the time. But in, in doing that, I admit again that I have lied to people that trusted me. So we can agree that the prosecution and law enforcement and so many of your friends and family heard for the first time your story about the kennels yesterday after all these weeks of testimony. Can we agree on that? That law enforcement, mm -hmm. my partners, and my friends heard me say that for the first time. Yes, I agree with that. Would you agree with me? that your own lawyer was repeating your story that you were at home napping as late as November of 22 on national television? I don't, I don't know. I, you don't know that? No. Nah, in jail, we don't, we don't get newspapers, and the, the TV we have is limited. So. so your own lawyers, at least as late as November 22, didn't know this story that you've told to this jury after five weeks of your family and friends coming in and saying, yeah, that's him on that video. I don't Jackson, know. Your Honor, violates attorney-client privilege communication. Totally improper. Yes, sir. Response. 
He uh, has brought up his communications with counsel, and now I, that is fair game, Your Honor. His communications through counsel with, or alleged communications with the prosecution. He didn't. There's, there's no attorney-client privilege to national television interviews. The objection is overruled. Are you waiting for me to answer, Mr. Waters, or did I answer? I, I, I think the point's made. All right, sir. You, you said you were unaware of that national television interview. Is that what you said? You unaware, unaware of what national television interview? The one where your lawyer repeated that story as late as November of 2022, your story that you were actually home asleep at the house. The, the, only, the only national TV uh ad that I'm aware of is, uh, not ad, program, is one um, that Mr. Griffin was involved in was a, are you referring to like a Dateline something? I'm talking about HBO. Okay, HBO. Mm -hmm. All right, like, so yeah, I, I, I am aware of that. And, and what I believe the case to be is that I believe that when that was in its works, that Mr. Griffin made those statements sometime substantially before um, November of 22, as early as around the very beginning of 2021. Well, let's talk. Uh, at least what I understand to be the case. All right, let's talk some more about your testimony from yesterday. And you're telling this jury, even on something as clear as a skin video, that your story doesn't change when you have to make them fit the facts that no longer can be denied. Is that what you're telling this jury? I don't understand that question. Say that again. I said, you're telling this jury that you don't change your story to make the facts fit evidence you can no longer deny, like what's been going on in this courtroom. I'm not telling the jury anything about that. All right, good. All right, let's move on. Let's talk some more about that issue. Um, let's talk about... The confrontation on June the 7th with Jeannie Seconder, which you said was no big deal. Isn't that what you testified? Words to that effect? I, I, I think what I testified to is that to me, it certainly didn't seem like a confrontation. Jeannie came to me and was almost apologetic. And this is what I believe, Mr. Waters, is I believe that what Jeannie Seconder and my partners have had to go through since September has been hard. I, I, I know they, I mean, I could see it. Um, I could see the hurt that I caused them. And, and I know that they're betrayed. And I know that they're angry. And I know that they're hurt. And I want to make clear to this that while I disagree with what Jeannie said as to it being a confrontation, because I don't believe that it was, I don't think that she was lying. I think that she feels it. I, I, th I think that, you know, she believes that that's the case after all this time that she's had to deal with this. But on June the 7th, when she came to me, she was almost apologetic. She, she you, you heard her say that she said, that she wouldn't be doing her job if she didn't do this. And it was made clear to me that someone had said this, um, that I, I had to make sure that income came through the firm, that I couldn't structure money. In other words, I had the impression that there was concern that maybe, like Mark Ball and Ronnie Crosby said, that maybe I was hiding, hiding um, fees because of the civil boat case. But that conversation was so quick, Mr. Waters, that you keep using the, the, the term confrontation. I didn't take it as a confrontation. And you're telling this jury you're not making that issue fit, make your story fit with those facts by saying, ah, it wasn't a big deal, and Jeannie, 
she's hurt, so she's overreacting now. No, that's you not what I'm saying. You've got stand and testify. What I'm saying is exactly what I just testified to, that to me on that day, that was not a confrontation. It ended almost as quickly as it began, and I didn't think about it again for a period of time until after everything happened. You testified earlier you get paranoid if a police officer turns out behind you, but you're not getting paranoid when Jeannie comes in here and says, I need an answer about these fees? No, because, because I believe you took them? No, it, things like that wouldn't cause the, the, the paranoid thought and the, and the paranoid thinking. It was always related to pills. It was always, okay, that reaction that somebody just gave me. Do, it was do, always related to pills. Do, do they know something? did something somebody said it, it was i mean the the, the time that that's what when i when i had to deal with paranoid thinking that you know if a, if a judge confronted me in the courtroom about a piece of evidence or if uh genie asked me about that those those are not things that gave me paranoid thinking okay and you testified the same thing about the boat hearing on June 10th. Not worried about it. No big deal. Correct? No, I didn't say that it was no big deal. But I said that my main concern about those motions coming up on June the 10th dealt more with the venue motion than they did with the motion to compel. I believe is what I said. Are you saying on this jury that you didn't testify yesterday that you weren't concerned about it? I wasn't overly concerned about it. Okay. And I'm sure I had some level of concern because right. the venue motion was it was a it was a big issue in the case. Well, were you concerned enough about it to bow up on Mark Tinsley at the trial lawyers conference and say, what are you doing, Bo? No, absolutely. Unequivocally never happened. If the Ferris fee issue comes to light on June the 7th, you're not going to be able to borrow money from Johnny Parker anymore, are you? If the Ferris fee, hypothetically speaking, if the Ferris fee came to light on June the 7th, well, here, any point in time, if the Ferris fee came to light, Johnny Parker would not loan me money. Okay. If, if, if Johnny knew that I had taken fees I would not have been able to borrow money from Johnny Parker. You testified earlier about going to the uh, Gamecock baseball game on the weekend prior to Monday, June the 7th, 2021, correct? That's correct. Hold on for me real quick. Sir? I'll show you what's been marked as stage 572 to this trial. You got your readers with you, your glasses. And have you, first, I just want you to look through that document and then answer the question do you generally know what that is? something so if you'll stand for a moment everybody stand for a moment
We come to order. Please, court. Have you had a chance to review that, Mr. Murdoch? Yes, sir. All right. And do you recognize what those are generally? I do. And what are they? Text between Maggie and I. And what day did they take place? Um. June the, June the 6th. June the 6th, 2021. Is that correct? That's correct, yes, sir. All right. At this time, the state would offer states 572 in evidence. No objection. To admit without objection. All right. Tell the jury, where were you when these texts were taking place? I was in the hotel. And where, what city were you in? Columbia, South Carolina. All right. And where were um, I'm not exactly sure where they were when they first started, but they would have been somewhere between a hotel, a restaurant, and the ball field. All right. But when you send this text on June 6th at 1141, you say y'all in seat already, correct? Yes, that's what I did say. And they say, yeah, Maggie says, yes, we like these seats. Is that correct? All right, that's correct. I, I didn't notice that. So at that point in time, they are in the ballpark. All right, and then you respond better than last night. They extended checkout to one. Going to come then. Is that correct? That's what that text says. Yes, sir. All right, so you're back at the room. Is that right? Yes, sir. Later on, you text after she asked you to bring a charger and says, Muggy, you text, I'm dreading it. See you in a little bit. Is that correct? That's what I said. Yes, sir. She responds, don't come, but then asks about the charger and says it's hot. Is that correct? Uh, Mr. Waters, I, yes, I assume you were reading it exactly so. Yes, sir. All right. She eventually responds, not crowded, but not the place to come. If you don't feel well, very hot and muggy, we are inside, sitting at the bar, very nice indoors. Is that correct? That's what it says. Yes, sir. You respond, dialed you by accident. They are making me leave, so I'll see y'all in a few. Is that correct? That's correct. And who was making you leave where? Uh, it, was it was past checkout time at the hotel. After you'd gotten an extended checkout, correct? It appears so. And the reality is, is that you were in that hotel suffering from withdrawals when that's going on. Is that correct? I was beginning to, yes, sir. All right. And the reality is, is that your wife and your son were on you at that time period because they had found pills just a few weeks prior. No, sir, that's not correct. talk about June 7th, okay? You uh, got up that morning, or what time do you think you got up and left that day? After having the benefit of looking at all these records, mm -hmm. um, I don't know what time I got up, and, and looking at the records, obviously I've been up for a while, um, but it appears I left shortly after noon. Okay. And you went to work? I did, yes, sir. And what were you working on at work? I was working on uh, this Dominion Energy case uh, was primarily what I was working on, that uh, we had motions coming up later in that week. 
Um, as I said earlier, it's, I believed at the time um, that it was the biggest case that I'd ever been involved in. Um, and there were motions coming up in that. Uh, I was preparing. Danny had been, Danny Henderson, my partner, that was helping me with the civil uh, case from the boat wreck, had been on me about getting a financial statement, and I finished doing that so that it could be given to Danny. It's primary. It's what I remember doing. I obviously, I, I talked to Jeannie. Um, but okay. And what time did you leave? And I'm sure I did some other routine office things, but I can't tell you what they are. All right. And what time did you leave? Uh, it appears that I left around a little after six from the records. Okay. I thought I'd left earlier than that, but I mean the records were seem to be pretty clear. All right. And you were, in fact, I think you said in both many of your interviews that you were working on the boat case that day as well, your financial declaration. I, yes, I, I prepared the financial declaration. I didn't do any work in this civil case. Um, so my, my work in, in, in that is what I did. I prepared the financial statement, which took me a little bit of time to, 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 to get the details on that, but I mean that was the work I did on in preparation for the motions coming up. And what time did you get home? Um, in looking at the records, it looks like I got home uh, a little before 7, 6.45, I think, 6, 6.40 something. Mm -hmm. Then you and Paul rode the property? Correct. And you, you told law enforcement you shot a 22? That's correct. You told law enforcement that you never saw any blackout? That I'd never seen a blackout? That, at that point in time when you and Paul were riding the property? No, I did not see a blackout. Did you tell law enforcement that you and Paul were around, going around looking for hogs? If I hey. said that, go ahead. And, and, and if I told them that, you know, you don't look for hogs in the daytime. All right, that just the hogs are deep in the swamp in the daytime. So I can tell you that Paul and I were not riding around looking for hogs. But what we were doing is we were going from food plot to food plot, and we were looking for hog signs, all right? What a hog will do is come out and root, and they tear up food plots. They tear up, they tear up everything. And so that was one of the things we were doing. But we were not hog hunting. We were not looking for hogs. We did not have the 300 blackout with us. Okay. Paul didn't have the gun that he that blackout that he favored with him while y'all rode the property. The gun that's in here? Any any rifle. There was no three hundred blackout with me and Paul. All y'all had was a twenty two. And that was a twenty two pistol, but we didn't have that with us at that time riding the property. Right. And you testified You've seen this, the Snapchat video of you in the tree, is that right? I have seen that. And you don't dispute the time of that video, do you? I don't, I don't even know what time that was taken, but whatever the gentleman we'll came and testified to, I don't dispute that. All right. And what time, well, let me ask you this. When did you go back to the house? Were you with Paul or were you by yourself? I was by myself when I went back to the house. I went back to the house basically when Maggie got there. When Maggie got there. All right. And where, where had Paul gone prior to that? Was he back at the house already or he came after you? Paul was at the shop when I went back to the house. All right. So you beat him to the house is what you're saying. Is that right? I beat him to the house? Yeah. You were at the house prior to him getting there. Yes. And you say Maggie 
was there at the same time or there before you or there after you? That's what I'm not absolutely certain about. Mm -hmm. I believe that Maggie came through the kennel entrance and going back and looking at these records and these times, I believe she came through the kennel entrance while Paul Paul and I were at the shop. Mm -hmm. But either way, I got to the house very shortly after Maggie got there. Okay. And I, I believe that she came through and I believe that I went right behind her. And when did you take the shower that you've been talking about? I believe when I first went in the house. I mean, I would have talked to Maggie for a second, but I'd seen her that morning, so I would. You left your clothes on the floor? I'm not sure. It makes sense to me, given what Blanca's um, said, but I, I couldn't tell you one way or the other. All right. About what time was that, you think? In looking at the records, I think that was a little after 8. And you're saying Maggie was already there at that point? When I got to the house? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And what did you do after that? I came back out, sat out on the couch to eat dinner. All right. What About what time was that? A few minutes later. I mean, it didn't take me long to shower. And... You say Paul was already eating at that point? He was. You say he left first. What I, what I said is he got up and he finished eating. Mm -hmm. And he left our immediate vicinity. Now, um, I don't believe he left at that point, given what I've looked at time records and all. I believe that he was around the house for... A little bit longer. And just to be clear, again, but I didn't see him. All of this detail was people were hearing for the first time yesterday, like we talked about before, correct? Say that again. All of this detail that we're going through right now is not anything that you related before. We're all hearing this for the first time yesterday. Objection, Your Honor. Fifth Amendment privilege. Objections overruled. So, yes, I, I, I did not tell law enforcement. Actually, I don't think law enforcement asked me what I did when we first went to the house, but I clearly lied to law enforcement about what I, what I said yesterday. Okay. And all of this, the last time you saw your, supposedly saw your wife and child, all of this detail, you, you as a lawyer and a prosecutor didn't think that was important to offer on your own? Oh, I think it's important. You told this jury how cooperative you were been, you've been and how much information you wanted to provide, but you left out the most important parts, didn't you? I left out, I left out that. I sure did. You don't consider that one of the most important parts? I think it's important. All right, tell me about what happens next. Tell me about how Maggie and Paul end up out down at the kennels. I'm, not, I'm still not absolutely certain exactly how they ended up at the kennel, but in looking at the time frames and looking at the, the GPS points, I, I think I pretty well know, because I wasn't sure if Maggie had walked to the kennels mm -hmm. or or ridden to the kennels. And I wasn't exactly sure how Papa got there, but um, I'm all but certain that Maggie and Paul went to the kennel together. All right. And what was the discussion? You said that they were going down there, but you didn't want to go. Is that right? Maggie. What I said is Maggie asked me to go to the kennels with her, and I wasn't going to go. I said I'm not going to go. And how long after she left did you supposedly go down there? It, it, it was very quickly. And what did you tell this jury in all these new facts as to the reason you changed your mind? Why'd you change your mind? I just had a shower. Mm -hmm. when, when you go to the kennel, you always end up at the shop, the dogs are running around, you're always going to end up doing more work. Mm -hmm. All right? It's hot. 
I'd already had a shower. I didn't want to go to the kennel. I understand that. So why'd you change your mind? Because Maggie wanted me to. So you thought about it for a few minutes and then decided to go down there? I don't think I sat and contemplated, am I going to go, am I going to go? I think that, like many things Maggie wanted me to do, if I didn't do it at first, I ended up doing it. And you took the golf cart down to the kennels? That's correct. How long did that take to drive from the house down to the kennels in a golf cart? You know, I, I, in looking at the records from OnStar and all of that, it seems to take about a minute in the um, golf cart. Nope, in the in the suburban. Mm -hmm. So I would think it's probably in looking at those speeds, uh, what 20, 24 miles an hour. I would think it takes double that. I think it takes a couple minutes. All right, so you'll concede at least a couple minutes to drive down there. Is I that think, right? yes. In a golf cart. That's correct. <clears throat> When the kennel video was going on, had you arrived before that? I believe that I had. Okay. How long do you think you had been there before that was going on? Not long. Um, because when I got there, in looking at the kennel video, you can see Paul Paul standing in the kennel. Mm -hmm. When I got there, Paul Paul wasn't standing in the kennel. He wasn't in the kennel anymore? Well, he wasn't in the kennel like he is in the video. Right. He's, I mean, he's probably, and I don't know exactly, but I know he wasn't in the kennel. He was like in the driveway. He was fooling with cash. He was in the driveway. Um, but like close to the kennel, but not in the kennel like he is in the video. <laughs> So the video happened after that, according to you? Video happened after I got after there? After you first saw Paul? You're saying he wasn't in the kennel. When did the video happen? I believe that to be the case. Okay. After you had arrived. Is that correct? Yes. And Very shortly after I arrived, but after I arrived. All right. And did you tell Maggie at that time that you were going to go to Alameda? I did not. Did you all discuss it at all, according to, you, to these new facts you're testifying to? I don't believe so. Did you have any conversation with her? Oh, yeah. Had you had a conversation, did you have a conversation with Paul about the dogs, about Cash's tail prior to going down there? Prior to going down there? I don't... Did I have a conversation with Paul yes. about Cash? Did you cash? talk to him about Cash and some problem with his tail prior to going down there? Did you have any knowledge of that prior to going down there? I'm not sure. As I sit here today, I, I don't recall that, but I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't think so. When you first arrived in the golf cart, where did you pull up to? I pulled up right where Maggie was. Which is where? She was standing in a spot where she could see in between the chicken coop and the storage room of the kennels, okay. where the dogs were back up in those planted pines behind the kennels to the left of the chicken coop. And what did you do after that? I went back to the house. No, I mean, did you, you pulled up, you get out of the... the uh, the golf cart? Oh, when I, no, when I pulled up, I stayed on the golf cart. Stayed on the golf cart. How long did you stay on the golf cart? <laughs> However long I was down there. The entire time? No, I got off to take the chicken from Bubba. All right, so how long were you down there before you took the chicken off of Bubba? Very short time. Like what? A couple minutes. And what were you doing during the couple minutes before you got over there to deal with Bubba? Talking to Mags. And what did y'all talk about? I don't know. You don't remember? No, sir. I do know that uh, Maggie was very concerned about Paw Paw. And um, you remember a lot of detail about all these new facts, but you don't remember what you talked about? I don't remember the exact details of what we talked about. I believe that at that time we may have talked about 
Paul, Paul. But I'm not certain. Were you withdrawing at this time? At this time, no, sir. You weren't withdrawing at all? No. I mean, I would only withdraw when I didn't have pills. And you're saying you had pills? Yes. Down there for a couple minutes, I think you've said now, before you get off the golf cart? About, yes, sir. All right. And where do you go at that point? I take the chicken from Bubba. All right. So you get up? Well, I mean, Bubba's, you know, Bubba's come out there with this chicken. I mean, he's showing us, hey, I caught this chicken. Mm -hmm. And I take the chicken from Bubba. Bubba came up to the golf cart? He came up by the golf cart. He came up to Maggie and I, which I was on the golf cart. She's by the golf cart. I mean, he's not coming to the golf cart, but he's coming to us. Is this during the kennel video or is this after the kennel video? Well, no, you hear Maggie say he's got a chicken. Okay. That's what she's talking about is Bubba caught a chicken. All right. All right. So is the kennel video still going on before you go get the chicken? I mean, you've heard it, correct? You've heard it in this courtroom. I don't know exactly. Um, I, I don't know exactly, but in close time into Bubba coming out of those woods with the chicken, mm -hmm. I got up and took the chicken from him. Okay. Let me ask you this. Were the dogs barking and carrying on or going out into the woods or acting like they sensed somebody was around that they didn't know? Were the dogs acting like there was somebody around that they didn't know? Yeah, like dogs do. No, the, no, they the, weren't. There was nobody. There was nobody. around that the dogs didn't know. Okay. Dogs didn't, didn't, to your indication, sense anything out of the ordinary. They were just chasing after the guinea. There was nobody else around. All right. Good. For them to to, to sense. You've heard the kennel video. Would you agree with me that it lasts for about fifty seconds? I agree with that. So it would have ended around 8.45 and 45 seconds. Would you agree with that? I do agree with that. Did you have the chicken out of Bubba's mouth at the end of the kennel video, or did it take longer than that? You know, I can't remember exactly when in the video he came up, up with the chicken, but I would, have had to, I would have had the chicken out of his mouth within 10, 15 seconds of of Maggie saying he's got a chicken. All right. And so then what did you do? I put the chicken up. All right. How long did that take? Did you get out of the golf cart to do that? I did. All right. And you had to go walk to where it was? Well, yeah. I mean, it, a few feet, but I, I, I did that, yes. All right. So how long did that take? And seconds. We're, we're at 846 now. How long did that take? Seconds. Just seconds? All right. And what did you do after that? Got back on the golf cart. Mm -hmm. And what did you do after that? I left. You left? Now, you did I jumped leave? on the golf cart and left. Well, that's what I was getting ready to say. Did I get on the golf cart and leave that second? Probably not. But did I get on the golf cart and leave very quickly after that? I did. Okay, yeah, I think you testified yesterday. I got out of there. I did. Why'd you get out of there so quick, Mr. Murdoch? Because it was chaotic, it was hot, and I was getting ready to do exactly what I didn't want to do. You were getting ready to do what you didn't want to do. That's correct. Yeah. I was getting ready to sweat. I was getting ready to work. I went back to the air conditioner. So did you say goodbye, according to your new story? Did I say goodbye? Yeah. Did you talk to them at all, or did you just get the chicken, put it on there, jump on there, and just oh, no. take off? I wouldn't have just gone off. I mean, I would have said, I'm leaving. Okay. Did I say goodbye or bye? And again, go but, ahead. I mean, there would have been some, you know, there, there would have been some exchange. I'm not staying here. Well, what was that exchange? I mean, you have, you've had such a photographic memory about these new stories. What, 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 what happened here? No, it's not. I can't tell you the exact words. You don't remember... Your conversation after you put that chicken up. Did y'all talk about the chicken? No, I don't think we did. Did you talk with Paul about Cash's tail? After the chicken? Yeah. 
No, I, I know I didn't do that. Did you tell Maggie I'm going to go check on him? At that point, no, I don't. I don't did you think tell I did. Maggie oh, it's hot out here? Think I'll go back? I, I certainly would have said something to that effect. All right. So, unlike everything else with the new story, you just can't recall what what that would have been. Well, I, you know, I mean. You're making that categorization. I think there's other things about that that I can't remember. But if the question is, can I remember exactly what words I used when I gave Maggie some uh, salutation when I'm leaving, I can't tell you what those were. All right. But it would have been something to the effect of, I'm leaving. All right. Okay. But you would concede that there was at least some conversation, that you wouldn't have just put the chicken on there and jumped, ran back to the golf cart and taken off. Correct. Without talking to Maggie, I would have never done that. All right. All right. So, Will, let's, uh, you want to say a minute? Does that sound about right? A minute for what? To have just whatever interaction it took for you to then, according to your new story, drive back to. No, sir. It, it wouldn't have taken me a minute. It would have been, it would have said, it would have been, I'm leaving. I'll see you in a minute. Okay. So, 30 seconds? I don't think it would have taken 30 seconds, but I mean, I'm fine with you using whatever time you want to apply. Well, but I don't I'm think I'm just it asking about real life here and, and how people interact with one another, uh, Mr. Murdoch. I mean, so what you're telling this jury, I call you're fuzzy on these kind of details, is that you jetted down there, you dealt with the chicken, and jetted right back. No, no sir. No, sir. I, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't jet down there, and I didn't jet back. I got up after Maggie asked me to leave, after, after Maggie asked me to go with her, and I didn't. I got up, I went and got on a golf cart, mm -hmm. I drove down there, I did what I did, I said I'm leaving or something to those words, mm -hmm. and I went back. All right. Well, if it's about 8.46, if the kennel video ends at 8.45 and 45 seconds, and it's about 8.46, we at least can see that maybe it was about a minute before you got on that golf cart and headed back. Just reasonable real life. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, I don't think it was that long, but maybe, sure. All right, so. But I don't think it was that long. I mean, right, well, exactly what I thought was going to be going on at that kennel, why I didn't want to go there to begin with, is exactly yeah. what was going on. Yeah, well, I get that. I get and that. I left. Are these also... Convenient facts in your new story that have to fit with the timeline now that that evidence has been thrown in your face? No, sir. Does that sound like real life to you, that you jet down there and jet back, Mr. Murdoch? Mr. Waters, as I just told you, I didn't get on my golf cart and jet down there. I didn't jet back. Those the reason why you have to be so fuzzy Waters, about these details. Mr. Uh, Waters, hang on. Just answer before we, another question is presented. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm answering moment. your question. This moment. Are you responding to the last question? Yes, sir. I'm responding to your question, and, and, and you're using words that I'm not using. And, and, and I'm, that's your categorization. Do you agree I'm in, entitled to ask my questions to you, sir? Absolutely. Okay. And, and I'm going to answer them. Uh, All I'm saying is I'm, I'm t taking issue with the manner in which you're changing what I'm saying so and you disagree this is a new story? You disagree with that characterization? Yes. This, this is the first time that this is being told openly. And you disagree to my characterization that you've got a photographic memory about the details that have to fit now that you know the, these facts, but you're fuzzy on the other stuff that complicates that. You disagree with that? I do disagree with that. I, I, I think that I... I think th right. that I have a good this? memory about a lot of things on this. How about this? We got the Kim Lennon video ending at 8.45.45. So just to take care of the chicken, put it up. I was going to say 8.47, but somewhere around there. I think you said somewhere around there. Is that fair? Just to do whatever you need to do and get on that cart before you head back. The kennel video ended at 8.45? In 45 seconds. 8:46. It, it certainly could have been 8:47 before I left out of there. Okay. I think it was sooner than that, but it could have been. All right. That's 60 seconds, and 50, 75 seconds, correct? After it ends. If it ends at 
eight forty five and forty five seconds. It's a minute and fifteen seconds. And you characterized it yesterday as I got out of there, right? That is exactly what I did. Right. So if we're at eight forty seven, I think you said benefit, giving you the benefit of the doubt, it's two minutes to get up back to the house, correct? Approximately. All right. And when you got back to the house, where'd you park the golf cart? Same place I'd gotten it from, right where Mark Ball testified that it was. All right. And what door did you go in? I would have gone in the front door. And if you left around 847 and it took about two minutes to get up to the house, what time would that make it, Mr. Murdoch? If I left at 847 and if it took me two minutes, that would make it 849. 849. When you testified, you went inside and the TV's on, right? I did go inside and the TV was on. Okay. And you laid down, is that right? I did. All right. Before you said you'd been napping for an hour or so, we're napping that entire time, but now you you lay down on the couch? That's correct. All right. And maybe doze for a second? Maybe. According to your new story? How long did you doze? I, I, if, if I dozed, extremely short time. Extremely short time? Because you would agree with me that at 9.02, you're up and moving, according to the data. I agree that according to that data, my phone's recording steps at whatever time it is, 9.02 something. How long did it take you, if you're at the house at 8.49, how long before you went late on the couch? I would have gone straight to the couch, probably. I may have gone by the sink or, I, you know, I may have gotten a spit cup, but it would have been basically straight to the couch. Straight to the couch? Yes, sir. And you're telling this jury that that's what happened and you were back at the house at 849 and you lay down on the couch and dozed for a second and then you were up with more steps in a shorter time period than you had done all day. Well, I mean, your number is 849. What I'm telling this jury is that I went down there and when I took that chicken from Bubba, I would have said something to Mags. I got back on that golf cart and I drove back to my house. After getting back to my house, I went inside, and in short order, I went to the couch. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm telling this jury. Did you go anywhere, anywhere else in the house? Mr. Waters, I can't tell you specifically about that. I, I don't think so, but I may have. Did you have that tan blackout and a 12-gauge shotgun on that golf cart when you drove down there? No. You didn't? No. Did you see them when you were down there? No. No. So we got you back around 849, and you're leaving at 902, correct? And you didn't see any weapons down there. You just happened to be back there. You didn't hear anything at all. Did you hear anything at all, Mr. Murdoch, during that time period? No, I did not. You didn't? Didn't you tell law enforcement that you thought you heard them pull up? Didn't you tell law enforcement that? I did think they had okay. pulled up. All right, so that was that you did think that? Yes. All right. So now you're saying there was a car pulling up? No. You didn't testify to that yesterday, did you, in your new version of events? That no, I, I don't. Construct? Mr. Waters, I don't believe there was a car pulling up. Okay. But that's what you told law enforcement, didn't you? No, I told law enforcement that I thought they had pulled up. Okay. All right. But you're saying you couldn't hear blackout shots, supposedly, but you could hear that, correct? I didn't say I couldn't hear blackout shots, but I'm saying that I thought when, when I got up from taking a nap, if I took a nap, but when I got up from laying down, as I was getting ready to go to my mom's, there was a point in time where I thought Maggie and Paul had come back. You also told them that you thought you heard a wildcat, but maybe it was a person or something like that as well? No, that's not what I said. What did you say then? I said when I went outside that there's a 
a, a, a house cat that's a, what just gone wild, and he hangs around. He goes from hanging around the shop, goes from hanging around the house. Different times you might, and, and there'd be times you don't see him. And he had been around the house. Mm-hmm. And when I went outside, I believe that cat was over there. Okay. But, and you made a point of mentioning I that never, to law enforcement. I never thought it was a person. All right. But you made a point of mentioning that to law enforcement, correct? In the course of discussing it, I did tell them that. But you never told them all this new story that you've constructed in light of this trial. Is that correct? I did not tell them that I went to the kennel. I lied about that. And at the same time, you also looked at this jury and tried to tell them that you had been cooperative in this investigation. Uh, Other than lying to them about going to the kennel, I was cooperative in every aspect of this investigation. Very cooperative, except for maybe the most important fact of all, that you were at the murder scene with the victims just minutes before they died. Right? I did not tell them that I went to the kennel. We'll take a break at this time for about 15 minutes, talking to the jury. Please uh, go to the jury room. Please not discuss the case. Please do not discuss your testimony with anyone during the break. We'll be in recess for 15 minutes.
I remind everyone in the courtroom that there is to be no reaction to the testimony. No jeers, cheers, no reaction at all by anyone in the courtroom. You bring the jury. On the record before the jury comes in. There will be an opportunity to put some something on the record. If it's regarding an objection, it can be done later. Yes, sir. Thank you. You may proceed. When you picked up that chicken, was there any blood on it? I don't believe so. Did you wash your hands or all? Did At that you... point in time, um, I don't believe that I did. And when you say you were there, you said Maggie was near nearby you, is that correct? Right by me. Was she messing with the hose at all? At that time, no, she was not. Did she mess with it the entire time that you were there, according to uh, your new facts today? While I was there, she did not touch. She, she was not fooling with a hose at all. which is the uh, condensed timeline. If I could have computer input, please. It's the condensed timeline, Mr. Griffin. See that up there, uh, Mr. Murdoch? Yes. All right, I'm on page five. You see that uh, cell tower map there? That's up on my screen? Yeah. I do see that. Um, would you agree with me that it reflects no cell tower activity on your phone? from 6.52 to 9.04? I do agree with that. Let me ask you this, Mr. Murdoch. Did you take your phone with you down to the kennels according to the new facts that you're testified to yesterday and today? I must not have. You must not have? If this is accurate, no, sir. Is that typical for you? Sure it is, it's absolutely. Typical. Okay, tell me why that's typical. If and when I'm going now, it wouldn't be it. It would be unusual if I was going out for any extended period of time, or if I was going uh, e even on the property. If I was going somewhere for an extended period of time, 
I would usually have my phone. But for me to go knowing that I'm going to the kennel and coming right back, that's not unusual at all. I mean, there's very, you've heard the testimony about the service out there. The service is terrible. You have to be in a particular spot. And you have to find a spot. So the answer is you don't know whether or not you took it down there. I believe that I probably didn't based on this data. Based on this, but unlike your photographic memory about other things, you don't remember whether or not you had your phone on you. Mr. Waters, I, I've never claimed to have a photographic memory, but I do not specifically remember if I had my phone that night. I do not dispute it based on these, on this data, and that's not unusual for me. Just like you don't remember, according to your new story, the last conversation you had with Maggie. No, I remember, I remember having the con my last conversation with Maggie. Looking at this screen, you have uh, the map up there. We're on page six, and it shows you arriving back at Moselle at 642. You don't dispute that now, is that correct? No, that's, that's what the, this data appears to show. Okay. And looking at the data, moving on to page seven, you have Paul arriving about 7.04. Is that correct? You don't have any reason to dispute that? Well, that's what it says. He arrives at 4147 Moselle Road, um, which is the address of the shop. Um, the house is 4157. I believe that Paul actually got there a little bit before that, um, but I think that's approximately accurate. Okay. I think Paul got there a little bit closer to 7 o'clock. You would agree, though, that's the earliest data point that reflects his presence in Moselle? If that's what the records show. You don't dispute that? I don't dispute that that's the, if that's the earliest data point. Um, but again, I believe he got there a little bit earlier. And I, I tried to look at these records to see if, I could dis if, if that could be refuted. And I, I believe he got there a little closer to 7 or a little bit before 7. Yeah, that's a good point. You looked at these records a lot before you had your testimony yesterday and today, didn't you, Mr. Murdoch? I've looked at these records other than the OnStar records that just came um, when they were provided to me. Sure, I've looked at them. Okay. Uh, right here, we have some steps on your phone, 29 steps. And then down at the bottom, we have uh, 89 steps. Is that uh, consistent when you and Paul were together on the property? I mean, sure. We, we would go to different locations on the property. Sometimes we would get out. Sometimes we wouldn't. We'd get out and walk around. We'd look at stuff. We'd do things. For example, you saw me messing with the tree. There'd be other ones. We may get out and look at a feeder. There may be other ones. we get out and look at hog signs where hogs are rooting. So it, it would be perfectly consistent with what Papa and I were doing that day. And 8.05 to 8.09, would you agree that that's the last steps recorded on your phone before 9.02 when you become a very busy bee? If that's what these records show, I see I took steps. These records show I took steps between 8.05 and 8.09. All right. So would you concede then that you're at the house around 8.09? I would have thought so, yes. Okay. And you said Paul was already back at that point? No. I, I, I said just the opposite. When did he get there? All right. You talking about when I left the shop and went to the house when Maggie was there? Yes, before you ate dinner. No, as I said earlier, Paul and I were at the shop. Mm -hmm. Maggie got home. I left Paul at the shop, and I went to the house. Mm -hmm. I think you were saying that I said I met Paul at the house, and that's incorrect. Paul was still down at the shop when you were at the house, correct? When I first went to the house, Paul was still at the shop, I believe. All right, and was Maggie there when you arrived at the house? 
Yes, I believe she was. All right. And 809 is the last steps that you have on this phone before 902, correct? That's what the data shows. Looking now at page 15. I'm sorry, page 14. Your steps that you say when you got to the house is 809 and Paul was still down at the shop. But don't these records reflect that Paul is pinging with GPS data at the house at 808? This record appears to show Paul at the house at 808. All right. So those records don't fit with your new story that you testified yesterday and today. Is that correct? No, I, I don't. I don't believe even right now, Mr. Waters, that that's right. I'm not saying what you're doing is you're taking 809 and saying that I'm at the house. And I mean that may or may not be right. But what I'm saying is is that when Maggie came through, I left, and I believe that Paul um, stayed at the shop. Now, did Paul come right behind me? I I'm not sure. But when I when I left him, I believe that when I left to go to the house, I believe that Paul stayed at the shop for a minute. When you got to the house, did you put your phone down? I'm sure I did. Did you put it in the car in the suburban? Did I put it in the suburban? When you got back to the house, did you put it in the suburban? Was the suburban parked out front? Uh, the suburban would have par been parked wherever I parked it. Which is where? I believe on the side. Okay. And did you put the phone, your phone in the suburban? At that time? Mm -hmm. No, I did not. Where would you put it? I'm not sure where I put it. You're not sure about that either, huh? No, I'm not sure. When I went in the house, I'm not sure where I put my phone. I would think that I, you know, I would think that I put it uh, down somewhere, probably by the couch. Didn't you testify yesterday when you were being asked by your, your lawyer about that pause at Alameda when you were living, leaving, and you had a very specific recollection of your phone had fallen down in the crevice and you had to pick it up and get it out? You remember testifying to that? I do. But you don't remember what you did with your phone when you got back at this point, huh? I mean, Mr. Ward, those are two distinct, different things. I'm, I'm coming in the house and I put my phone down. I don't have a routine spot that I put it in right on this corner or right there, you know. Yeah. I, I, would, I would assume that when I went in the house, I put it somewhere either on the table you go by, going to the, going to the couch. I may have taken it to the bathroom um, well, that, when I took a shower. It, it may have it? taken me a, a, a few minutes to go to the shower. Uh, so that I can't tell you exactly story. where I put it. That console story is an awful specific recommend, uh, recollection when you need it to try to make the new story that this jury's hearing and everyone's hearing yesterday and today with the data, correct? But you're awful fuzzy on far more important things, aren't you, Mr. Murdoch? Which, which question? I, here, I'll answer the first one first. No, I, first one first I, I, I don't believe that's convenient, and I disagree with your uh, categorization uh, of the description. All right. But you, you remember the console story, but you don't remember where you put your phone, whether or not you took it down to the kennels, whether it was in the, uh, you put it in the suburban, don't remember any of that. But, Dad, do you remember that uh, console story, correct? Well, I don't remember the console story, but, you know, in that suburban, and, and it's not the first time that it happened, but when that phone got down there, you had to go to great efforts to get it out, and you couldn't just reach over there and get it out. All right. You say when you got to the house that Maggie was already there? Yes. Okay. And we saw your last steps were at 809? Well, that's what you saw when my, this data recorded my last steps. But as you heard this testimony, too, um, Mr. Waters, you know, that's not a precise, that, that's not a, a, a precise, you heard the testimony, you know what it is. Well, how did you get back to the house? Remind us. From the shop? Yeah. I went in the white pickup truck. Went in the white pickup truck? Okay. And when you got in the house, where did you go? 
we've, we've already discussed this. I, I, I took a shower. Whether I did things for a moment before I went to the shower, I'm sure I talked to Maggie um, because she'd been gone. And if she came through the kennel, which I believe she did, we only talked briefly. So I would have talked to her, uh, but I would have quickly gone to take a shower. Going over to page 16, you would agree with me that the data reflects Maggie start logging steps and her phone disconnecting from the Mercedes around 817, correct? I agree. At 817, her phone ends connection to her Mercedes. And starts logging steps. I don't see that, but I don't dispute it. You see the purple line talking about it disconnecting from the Mercedes? I, do see, I, see, just, I see where you're talking about. So, yeah, yeah, I see at 817, her phone starts logging steps. I agree with that. Okay. So would you concede that that appears to be when she arrived? Uh, no, I, I don't believe that's when she arrived. I, I, I believe that, I mean, it, it was very normal for Maggie um, when she's driving to jump out of the car, run inside, go to the bathroom, do things and either send me or Paul or go back or Buster or go back to her car herself and unplug her phone. So, I mean, I agree that's when her phone's unplugged, but I believe that Maggie got to the house a little bit before that. That's the whole reason why Paul and I went to the house. Okay. But you're saying Paul arrived after Maggie. Is that what you're saying? At the house? At I believe so. Time. Yes, sir. Okay. That's what I recall. And, and Paul arrived at the house after I arrived at the house, I believe. <clears throat> and if Paul got to the house around about that same time, he wasn't inside with Maggie and I when I went to get to the shower. So you say if Paul got, he wasn't inside with Maggie and you? Is that what you said? Mr. Murdoch, is that what you said? Sir? You said if Paul got the house prior to that, he wasn't inside with you and Maggie? Is that what you said? I'm saying he was not inside when I went to get in the shower. Okay. Right. Again, looking back at this data point, 808, we see a little blue dot right there in the middle of the house, don't we? Yeah, that's what these records show. Okay. And it also shows that circle that folks testified to, what the range of what it could yeah, absolutely. be within. So, I mean, it clearly could look be. Look at that circle. Look. Look at what's right in the middle of that circle. Almost like somebody drew a circle around the house, don't you agree? Yeah, I do. But also in that circle is where you would park a truck if you pulled up. All right. So, you know, and I'm not saying that he wasn't in the house uh, at some point in time there. But when I went to get in the shower, he wasn't in the house. And he very easily could have been there and been parked in the yard. All right. You agree at the bottom of page 16 that uh, about 8.30, Maggie starts tracking steps again on her phone? Yes, sir. That's what the data shows. with me that about 838 Paul's phone shows him back up at the kennels well uh, yes sir I agree that at 838 let me see which one it's hard for me to figure out which one of these rings but at 838 it shows Paul 
in whichever one of those rings is 56 meters wide. And I have no reason to believe he wasn't at the kennel. And then 844.55, we've already gone through this, but that's the kennel video, right? Yes, sir, that's correct. And you would agree with me that it lasts about 50 seconds, correct? Uh, yes, sir, I agree with that. And you would agree with me moving on to page 19 that both Maggie and Paul's phones locked for the final time around 849. That's what the data shows. After that, you agree that Maggie's phone around 853 shows some steps being taken? That's what the data shows, yes, sir. Data doesn't show who's carrying it, but that's what it shows. Is that correct? That is correct. And then you would agree with me that from 902 to 906, your phone finally comes to life and it starts showing a lot of steps. I do agree with that. What were you doing? I was getting ready to go to my mom's house. Getting ready to go? I thought you took a shower already. You were just laying down on the couch. What, what all you need to do to get ready to go to your mom's house? Uh, I mean, there wasn't anything to get ready in, in that aspect, wasn't but anything to get ready, I was, was getting it? ready to go. I was preparing to leave. So doing what? I don't know if I got up, uh, went to the bathroom. I don't know. I can't tell you exactly what I was doing. And that's far more steps in a shorter time period than, than any time prior, as you've seen from the testimony in this case. So what, what were you so busy doing? That's going to the bathroom? No, I don't, I don't think that I get on a treadmill? went to the bathroom. No, I didn't get on a treadmill. Jog in place? No, nope, I didn't jog you in jump place. Jacks? No, sir, I did not do jumping jacks. What were you doing, Mr. Murdoch, for those four months? Preparing to leave for my mom's house. What? What does that mean? I mean, you're in the front room on that couch where you say you laid down. The Suburban's just right outside. What all are you doing? I don't know if I got up and went to my room, went to the gun room, doing went back what? in that. Doing what? You've been so clear in your new story about everything. What, what were you doing during these four minutes? I, I disagree with your assertion about every detail. I don't recall. I know that I was getting up and I was leaving. I was going to check on my mom. But specifically what I was doing, I don't, I, I don't know. Okay. I know what I wasn't doing, Mr. Waters, and what I wasn't doing is doing anything uh, as I believe you've implied that I was cleaning off or washing off or washing off guns or putting guns in a raincoat, and I can promise you that I wasn't doing any of that. Okay. Also during this four minutes where you've got 283 steps, not only are you moving around a lot, but you're making a ton of phone calls. Because that, in that same time period, you see this red line right here, where over that four minute period, all those steps were taken. That's also when you're calling, making all these phone calls, isn't it, Mr. Murdoch? Well, I made the so phone calls. So you're in place and making phone calls? Is that what you're allowed to answer before Mr. Waters steps on him again with another question. Please. Thank you. All right. You were making all these phone calls while you were taking all these steps. Would you concede that where you don't remember what you were doing? Well, I was making phone calls and... That, that's shown here. At 9.05, I called my dad. You know, I, I don't know that I was taking steps like you're saying I'm taking steps. I heard the same testimony you heard, Mr. Waters, and, you know, steps can be recorded uh, any number of ways. I, I don't have a specific recollection of walking around. I don't know if I was hitting my phone like the guy showed or doing whatever that makes steps, but, you know. So you were hitting what, your phone like that while you were making all these phone calls? Hang on, no, sir. What I'm saying, Mr. Waters, I don't know that. I'm, I'm just giving you an example. You're saying that I'm running around taking these steps, and while I'm doing that, I'm making telephone calls. What I will agree with is that this data shows that there was 283 steps recorded on my phone. Mm -hmm. And sometime during that period, I made certain phone calls. Okay. 
All right, so not only for whatever it is, is recording steps, but you're also making a ton of phone calls, including missed calls to Maggie, who is 1,100 feet away, supposedly. It you're using the term a ton of phone calls. Yeah. What I agree is that I, I made the phone calls that are listed on these call data records, mm -hmm. which, you know, are very normal phone calls for me. Mm -hmm. Do you know why so many phone calls were missing from the log around this relevant time period when law enforcement downloaded your phone on June 10th? From my phone? Yeah. No, I don't. Did you delete them, Mr. Murdoch? Not intentionally. Just around the time of June 7th, all these calls were missing, but you had nothing to do with that between June 7th and June 10th. No, sir, I did not, mm -hmm. and I did not delete phone calls from my phone. Mr. Waters, one of the most important things in this whole thing for me has been getting this data that I believe would exist, phone calls and phone records, um, would be part of that. I've been in enough civil cases and used phone records enough times to know that you delete a phone call from your phone, it doesn't disappear. So I can tell you, this jury, and everybody who's listening that I did not intentionally delete phone calls from my phone. Yeah, because you started talking about the, you're, you're a former prosecutor, correct, and former lawyer doing civil cases. We went through that yesterday, and boy, you're busy bee on that phone right out of the gate at 902, right? Objections overruled. Am I a busy bee? Yeah. I, I am using my telephone at I think I call at 905, I start and call my dad, and I agree that I made other phone calls. And one of the first things you start talking about with law enforcement is these calls that you made to Maggie. Correct? You remember, recall that from your first statement to law enforcement? One of the first things that I said to law enforcement? Yeah, that's one of the things you talk about. I'm talking about with your interview with Special Agent Dave Owen. I don't remember that being the first thing we talked about, but first things. if Mr. Owens asked me about it, then I... No, you brought sure. it up, didn't you? I did. You don't recall? No, I don't, I don't recall. Would you dispute me if I said you brought it up? Did I brought up what? Brought your up phone, what? Mr. Murdoch, your phone. Phone calls to Maggie? Yes. Did I brought up phone calls to Maggie to David Owens? I'm asking you, is that one of the things that you talked about in your first interview with Dave Owen? That you pulled out your phone and started looking at it, that you brought that up? Do you recall that? Well, but that's not what you asked, Mr. Owens. You, you asked me, was that the first thing that I talked to him about? And that was the discrepancy. I certainly don't dispute that Mr. Owens and I talked about phone calls. But that's not what you said, so just right. to be clear. Well, the real reason, Mr. Murdoch, is that you as a lawyer and prosecutor are up at 9.02, finally having your phone in your hand, moving around and making all these phone calls to manufacture an alibi. Is that not true? That's absolutely incorrect. So that's just another circumstance and coincidence in this particular case right around the time that you lied to law enforcement about maybe one of the most important facts in the case. Comment before the question. It is an absolute fact that I am not manufacturing an alibi, as you say. How do you remember so much detail about everything else, but you don't remember what you were specifically doing to generate 283 steps while you're making these, all these phone calls in the same four-minute period? I remember unequivocally, without any doubt, with as clear a mind as I could have mm -hmm. at any time, that I never manufactured any alibi in any way, shape, or form because I did not and would not hurt my wife and my child. So, why so I know for a fact that I never, ever, ever created an alibi. Why don't you remember what you were doing when you were so busy for this four-minute critical period? I do other remember what I was, I was doing. Other than I was getting ready to go. 
Well, that's because that's what I was doing. Okay. Well, let's keep going. You made those calls to Maggie in that four minute period. You had just seen them a few minutes ago when you say you went down there and came right back. Why didn't you just take that quick little left 1,100 yards away and stop by? See why they didn't answer the call. You're obviously wanting to get in touch with them. Why didn't you go down to the kennels that were so close by? There was no reason to. I mean, Ma You're making multiple missed calls to Maggie, and she's so close. And there's a driveway right there. Why do you not just go down there and say, "Hey, guys, I'm heading over there"? It, it wasn't important to do that. Me, me making those phone calls is simply me letting. I believe I called Maggie, and I believe call, I called Paul, but. That, that, that's simply me just letting them know that I'm leaving for a minute, I'll be back. The fact that, that they don't answer is not unusual at all. Now, it is odd, it is unusual that they never call me back. Um, and, but, but at that moment, the fact that there's a missed call, when, when I know they're on the property, I mean, that doesn't even register at all. That's perfectly normal to try to call somebody who's on the property and not be able to get them. And and as far as not going down there, uh, there, there was no sense of urgency. Maggie was with Paul. You know, she should be as safe as she could be. Yeah, she should. Um, <clears throat> did you talk with Maggie about going to Almeida when you were at the kennels? No, I don't believe I did. Did you talk with Maggie about going to Almeida during supper? I know that we had talked about it. I, I had talked. I don't believe we talked about it at supper, but we may have. I know that I had talked about uh, that I was going to go over there. And then uh, I decided that I wasn't going to go over there. Um, but so I, what I, was your conversation at supper? Tell me specifically, if you could, please. I about can't, going to Alameda. I can't tell you that we specifically talked about it. The only thing that I can tell you we specifically talked about at supper was Paw Paw. All right. And what was the conversation? Maggie was just concerned. Paul Paul had been having, for a young person, Paul had been having high blood pressure. Um, and he's very resistant to go to the doctor. And um, this has been going on for a little while, but lately Paul's feet had swollen. And for a 22-year-old to have start having swollen feet concerned both of us, and it particularly concerned Maggie. And we talked about that. Did y'all talk about Mr. Randolph at all? I'm sure we did. Do you remember that group text coming in about uh, whether or not anybody was going to go see Mr. Randolph at the hospital the next day? Do I remember it coming in? Yeah. I don't remember it coming in. Yeah, but you didn't read it until the next day. But I've seen, I've seen the data. Why didn't you, uh, did you ever text the group and say you were going to Almeida at all? No. Did Maggie ever... Did you and Maggie ever specifically discuss her going along with you to Alameda? I don't believe that we did. I know that uh, there was a point in time where I said Maggie might go, but it's highly unusual for Maggie to go and visit just my mom. It, it, that, that whole situation, um, it just made, it made Maggie sad, and she didn't like to go. So... 
You, um, I don't believe that we did, but I do acknowledge that at some point I said she might go for some reason. You told law enforcement on multiple occasions that, first of all, Maggie was planning to stay at Edisto the night of June 7th, correct? I did say that. All right. And you also said that you came to find out that she came home of her own accord, correct? You told that to law enforcement. Is that true? She did come home of her own accord. That she decided on her own to come home because she was worried about you. Isn't that what you said? I did say that, and I, right. I, I, I believe that to be the case. All right. But since we've, despite what you told law enforcement, we've since seen the text that you actually called her and asked her to come home on the night of June 7th. No, sir. That's not correct. That's not correct? No, sir. That's absolutely not correct. All right. So... You heard your sister-in-law, Marion, testify to just that fact of a conversation which she had with Maggie, but you're saying that's not true? I don't believe that's what Marion said. All right. And you, your defense put in this exhibit, Exhibit 107, where Maggie texted Blanca and said, Alec wants me to come home. I've, I've seen that. I agree with that. Is that it up on the screen? Oh, I've got the wrong input here. I'll just hold it up. You've seen this text? I have seen that. M Mr. Waters, the only dispute I have with what you're saying is you're, you're saying that I called Maggie and wanted her to come home. I always wanted Maggie to come home, and I would have talked to Maggie about coming home before she ever left to go uh, to Charleston and to Edisto. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you this, and I didn't realize this at the time, but I realize it now, that Maggie was already undecided. About, now, I didn't know this, but Maggie was already undecided about uh, staying at Edisto. I can promise you that because Bubba and Grady were in their kennels, as y'all well know, that night, if uh, that day. If Maggie was certain that she was spending the night at Edisto, at a minimum, Bubba would have been with her, and probably both dogs would have been with her. It was very unusual for her to spend the night anywhere without one of us or those dogs. So, so you're that saying... tells me that when she left that morning, she was already seriously thinking about coming back. So you're saying that you never called her and had a conversation that day asking her to come home specifically on the night of June 7, 2021? Maggie and I had a couple of phone conversations that day. What I'm telling you is Maybe that before she question. left, no, no. I, I don't believe we had a phone call about that. We may have discussed it during the phone call, but I didn't make a phone call to her to ask her to come home. I had already told her I wanted her to come home. I always wanted her to come home. You heard Marion say that too, that I always wanted Maggie with me. Maggie thought enough of it to talk about it with Marion, didn't she? The fact that I wanted her to come home? Correct. Well, sure. I mean, that's what Marion said. So you're denying that you called Maggie and specifically asked her to come home that night? I didn't make a phone call to Maggie to ask her to come home that night. I asked Maggie to come home long before she ever left. And I probably asked her again each time I talked to her but I didn't make the phone call specifically for that, as you're saying. <clears throat> and to be clear, I'm certain that if Maggie was certain that she was spending the night, Bubba would have been with her and probably Grady. All right. Why did you tell law enforcement, though, that you found out after the fact that Maggie wanted to come home because she was concerned about you? Why don't you phrase it that way if what you're saying to the jury now was accurate? Why would you phrase it that way? Because I believe that to be the case. That you found out afterwards, but now you're saying you knew. No, I'm saying I found out afterwards why she came home, Mr. Waters. And she came home because she was worried about me. So I'm going to be clear about that. I did not learn that until 
I think the day after she got killed. But you're saying that you found out that after the fact, but you're telling this jury that you knew the things that you just said about her wanting to come home. And you were unaware of what Marion would say at that point either. No, I'm saying at that time, I had not thought about Bubba and Grady. Since that time, I've thought about that. I'm certain of that. At the time, I thought Maggie was staying at Edisto. All right? She was going to Edisto to, do the, to meet the people, to do the work. Maggie loved to stay at Edisto. There's no doubt about that. It would not be unusual at all for her to stay at Edisto. But just like every other time, I had already asked her, please come back, come back. Always wanted her to stay with me. Always. But I did not learn about, and, and Maggie even texted me, I'll see you in a few hours. But I did not know why she decided to come back until later, is what I'm saying. And I learned it from Blanca. Blanca actually showed me the text that she sent her talking about being worried about me. You would agree with me that you sent a text to Maggie at 908.58 while in motion in the Suburban, as reflected by the data? I do. Which was because I couldn't reach them by the telephone, and I wanted them to know where I was. which is what we do. And you got to Alameda around 922? I believe that's correct. I can go down to it. No, I, I, don't, I don't have any reason to dispute that. Made some more phone calls along the way? I did make more phone calls along the way while I was riding. Called Chris Wilson? I did call Chris Wilson. Had a short conversation with him. Is that right? I did have a conversation for however long the record show. About one, 131 seconds. Sound, that sound about right? If that's what the record show, two minutes. Called your brother, John Marvin, for about 106 seconds, including connection time. Does that sound about right? That does sound about right. Arrived at 922. Does that sound about right? It does. And then at 924, you call, that's the landline at Alameda, is that correct? That is correct. And then you went inside, is that right? Yeah, that's Talking right. To Shelley. That's right. I called the house phone to get Shelly to let me in. And when you were asked by law enforcement how long you were at your mother's house, you said 45 minutes to an hour. Isn't that correct? I think I said a couple of different things, but I think at one time I did say that. But, you know, routinely through these things, I kept saying, you know, when you get this data, you'll see exactly when you look at my phone, you'll see exactly when you do, you know, so, you know, the, uh, me giving the times was always given with the thought that, okay, that there's OnStar out there, there's whatever. 
But when you had a conversation with Ms. Shelley after the fact, you actually asked her to say that you were there longer than 20 minutes. You know, I heard Shelley's testimony. I, I, I believe Shelley to be a good person. Uh, I wasn't trying to influence Shelley on any particular length of time because at, at the beginning of this, I believed that data would show what data would show. And for me to tell her to say something when my own star is going to show something different just doesn't make any sense. So, you know, I, I can't answer that. What my recollection is is that I told Shelley that, that law enforcement would be talking to her. We may have discussed how long I was there. At that point in time, if I thought I was there 45 minutes, I may have said I was here 45 minutes, but, you know, I can't tell you. All right. And that's the same thing that Blanca testified to, that you talked to her about the clothes that you were wearing that made her uncomfortable, correct? Ask that question again. It's similar to your conversation with Blanca that she testified about when you talked to her about the clothes that you were supposedly wearing what, and what's, it made her feel uncomfortable. Do you remember that testimony, sir? What's similar to that? Well, that you're talking to both of these individuals about their testimony in a manner that's inconsistent with what they know. No, I, I don't. I don't think. I don't, I don't. I don't think your assertion is accurate. You have to understand this. On August the 11th, when I went to meet with David Owens, and in that, David Owens asked me about. He showed me that Snapchat and asked me about the clothes that I had on, and. Um, Shortly after that, the next time I was with Blanca, I asked Blanca about those clothes because David Owens had asked me about them and was make, made an issue about it. And so I checked with Blanca to see what, what I specifically uh, asked Blanca, and it was an issue to me. So I got Blanca, and I said, I need you to sit down and talk with me about this. This is important. Do you remember um, my clothes when you came to Moselle that day? And she remembered exactly what she testified to. She remembered that my pants were there. She wasn't sure if the shirt was there. At that time, I think she actually thought the shirt was there, but she was clear that she wasn't sure about that. Um, but oh no no she wasn't unsure but she didn't remember um but assumed that it was so that was the conversation that and why i was asking blanca well again you're very specific about your memories of that conversation is that correct mr murdoch you're dang right i'm I, i'm i'm consistent about that because a very short time before that david owens is asking me questions and telling me I'm a suspect in the murder of my wife and my child and asking me about my clothes, you're dang right it was important. It was important, right. And you're dang right I remember what, why I went to her and for what reason. Because the only thing you're concerned about is yourself. You're not concerned about giving accurate information to law enforcement, correct? What's the reason for that, Mr. Murdoch? Why don't you want to give accurate information to law enforcement? Why do you want to talk to these women who both are employed by you or your family and try to influence what they are going to say? Uh, I, I did want to give law enforcement accurate information. I told a lie about being down there, and I got myself wed to that. But I wanted to give them as much. I knew that I hadn't done this, and I wanted to give them as much accurate information as I could. But the reason I went to Blanca is specifically because David Owens talking to me on August the 11th. You can see that you're underway about 9.42, heading back. I 9.42 do. to 9.43. I do.
Turn on Moselle about 1001. Turn in a Moselle at 1001. Yeah. Um, Sorry. It looks to me like I turned in a Moselle at 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock on the dive, sir. Yes, sir. At the house at 10.05. Yes, sir. And then that's when you went back to the kennels after you came back from Almeida, correct? I went to the kennels after I went to the house. At, um, I went from Almeida to the house, to the kennels. And we got to the scene... You got out of the car, according to what you told law enforcement, repeatedly, and went and checked the bodies, correct? Before you called 911, is that correct? No, sir, that's not correct. You don't, you're saying you didn't say that to law enforcement? I don't know what I said to law enforcement, Mr. Waters, but I can tell you this. Mm -hmm. I pulled up. And I saw my agent Paul Paul. I jumped out of that car. I know that I went back to my car and I called 911 as quickly as I could. That point in time, when I got on the phone, then is when I went to them and did the things that I did. You what you're saying is not accurate. You're saying that you didn't say very specifically to law enforcement that you went to them prior to calling 911. When? After you got out of the car, you told law enforcement repeatedly that you went over and checked the bodies before you called 911. No, I don't. If I did say that, I don't believe that's accurate. Did I check Maggie and Paul before I called 911? Correct. No, sir. That's not, that's, not, I don't, that's not accurate. At least that's not what I remember. That's not what you remember saying, or that's not what you say now happened? No, that's not what, that's not what I believe happened. Okay, but you don't deny that's what you said. Did I said, did I check Maggie and Paul before I called 911? Correct. I don't believe that's what I said. <coughs> now, I know I checked them, but I don't believe I checked them before I called 911. Because I, I can pretty well remember vividly when I checked Paul Paul, I was already on the phone with 911. Looking at this data. show the vehicle parking at 10.05 and 55 seconds. Yes, sir. 10.05.57, the Suburban arrives at the kennels. you agree with that? Um, I'm sorry, say that again, Mr. Williams. At 10.05.57, it shows the Suburban arriving at the kennels. Okay. Okay. The 911 call was at 10.06.14. Okay. Just about 20 seconds later. You agree with that? Um, I think that sounds right. Yes, sir. I mean, that makes sense. 
But that goes back to what I'm saying is I, I pulled up Saw, I saw them, and I know I jumped out of my car. Um, but I believe that before I checked them, in fact, I'm almost certain, that then I went back and I got my, that's when I went and got my phone and I called down one way. Okay. And then, after I called 911, they, they, I mean, there was a little while where there wasn't, I don't, I don't think there was anything going on. And I believe that that is the time period that I went and checked on them. What you're saying here today, now that we have this data, that's not exactly how you expressed it to law enforcement in your prior statements. Is that correct? No, sir. I disagree with that. Okay. I totally disagree with that, Mr. Waters. Will you point to what you're talking about? Um, All right, Miss Murdoch, um, state your full name for me, please. Richard Alexander Murdoch. Uh -uh. And sir, what was your name? Yeah, Danny Henderson. Okay. All right. Um, as I stated, I'm David Owen and I'm Laura Rutland with Collin County. I'm with SLED. <laughs> I hate to have to do this. I understand. Yeah. I totally yeah. understand. Yeah. So you don't you don't have any problem yeah. with it. So um, just start at the top. Take your time. Um, like when I came back here, mm -hmm. I mean, I pulled up and I could see them, and you know, I knew something was bad. I ran out. I knew it was really bad. And my my boy over there, I could see. It was. <laughs> I'm sorry. 
and I could see his brain on <laughs> And I ran over to Maggie, and uh, actually, I think I tried to turn Paul over first. Um, uh, you know, I tried to turn him over, and uh, I don't know, I figured it out. Um, uh, his cell phone popped out of his pocket. I started to try to do something with it, thinking maybe, but then I put it back down really quickly. Um, then I went to my wife. And I, I mean, I could see. Mm-hmm. Did you touch Maggie at all? I did. I touched them both. Okay. I tried to take. I mean, I tried to do it as limited as possible, mm-hmm. but I, I tried to take their pulse on both of them. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and um, you know, I called nine one one. Um, pretty much right away, and she was very good. Um, <clears throat> I talked to her. Um, I told her I was going to get off the phone to call some family members. <coughs> I did that, um, and um, how many family members did you call? Anybody? I called my brother Randy. And I called my brother John. And I tried to call a little boy, a real good friend that's right around the corner from here, but I didn't get him. That person you didn't name, that was Rogan, the little boy right around the corner. Is that who you're talking about? That's correct. But going back to your question. I mean, that's, that's the way I remember it, what I said right there. And, I, you know, your, your question about did I do these things before I called 911, that's not what I said then, and that's not what I remember now. Okay. So you're saying now that you went out, you checked, you came back, got your phone, and that's when you called 911? I'm not saying that now, Mr. Wilson. I am saying that now, but... To me, that's what I said then. I mean, I, I told her, I called 911 right away. I didn't have, there was no time to do the things that I'm talking about doing in the, in, in the time between getting there and calling 911. When you talked about calling Rogan and you said that he lives right around the corner, correct? That's correct. Right. But... Rogan wasn't staying there at the time. That's the whole reason that Cash was at your kennel, right? You knew that. Well, Rogan was staying in, in Buford a lot, but he was home a lot too. I didn't I didn't know where Rogan was on a daily basis. Well, he to you about keeping his dog Cash at the kennels when he was staying with his girlfriend and working down in Buford? Yes, he he had asked me that. But I mean that had been some time before. I didn't know you're making a big deal about this, Mr. Waters, but that particular night, I, d- I didn't have a clue where Rogan was staying or not staying. I was trying to find somebody to come out there with me. I'd called Randy, I'd called John, and Rogan was the next best alternative. Okay. And Rogan Whoa. is so close. I mean, Rogan, of, of, of all these kids that you've heard, Rogan, Gibson, I mean, Roro is like a, a Rogan, you prefer when I call him Rogan, is truly like a son to Maggie and I. And he was such a good friend to Buster, and he was such a good friend to Paul. And you've been through everything I have. You'll see that two weeks or three weeks prior to this, I ran out of gas when Bus and Paul Paul weren't home. And Rogan's the person that I called to bring me gas. Nobody's disputing him. Any that Rogan would have helped you. Let me keep playing this. Around, um, Paul, when you walked up. Blood. Any, any other, anything else? 
I mean, there was some body thing. Yes, sir. I mean, like any other evidence. I know you said the phone fell out of the pocket. But did you see anything else that didn't belong or shouldn't belong or that wasn't part of Paul? No, sir. Not, no, not. No, sir. How about Maggie? No, sir. You didn't see anything around them? What made you come out here tonight? I went to, my mom's a late stage Alzheimer's patient. My dad's in the hospital. My mom gets anxious when she does. I went to check on them and Maggie. Maggie's a dog lover. She fools with the dogs. And I knew she'd gone to the kennel. I was at the house. You just testified that in the wake of this, you didn't know what you said to law enforcement. That was what you just said? No, I mean, I know, I know a lot of what I said to law enforcement, but there's a lot of things in looking back at this video for one, the 911 call for one. I mean, there's a lot of things that I didn't remember. Okay. But right then and there, just not long into this interview, you made a conscious decision to lie right there. Play that again? You said I was at the house. And I knew she'd gone to the kennel. I was at the house. I left the house. You want me to back it up some more? Well, yeah, we can keep listening to it. Anything around now? What made you come out here tonight? I went to, my mom's a late stage Alzheimer's patient. My dad's in the hospital. My mom gets anxious when she does. I went to check on them and Maggie. Maggie's a dog lover. She fools with the dogs. And I knew she'd gone to the kennel. I was at the house. You want to hear it again? No, sir. But I don't think... So you made a conscious decision to lie right there, this early into an interview, sitting in the front seat, correct? I don't believe so. You didn't make a conscious decision to lie? I don't believe that. I don't believe that was lying at that point. Okay. Tell me why not. Because Maggie had gone to the kennels and I was at the house. Okay. So you think you were being... That was not a lie at that point? I don't believe so. At what point did you decide to lie? I'm not sure, but it was in that... It was in this interview? I believe that it was. Okay. Was this interview where you're sitting in the front seat, correct? It is. You're not in custody, correct? I'm not in custody. They're giving you water, letting you chew tobacco, treating you politely, correct? They were treating me very politely. So what was it that clicked? So you said it's in this interview that it clicked that I'm going to lie about the most important fact that I know? I'm not sure exactly when in it that I lied, decided to lie, but I believe it was during this interview. I believe all those things that I talked about, you know, those things that had gone on, the things that people had said to me about don't talk to anybody without a lawyer. My partners all told me that, or a lot of my partners told me that. My dear friend, Chief Alexander, was one who said that. I overheard, I believe it was Sheriff Hill, I'm not positive, I overheard him tell, I believe Mark Ball or Gray Holmes, don't let him talk to anybody without a lawyer. And what I believe is that based on my distrust of SLED and getting in that interview, and I'm not positive about this, but I believe when he asked me, you know, about my relationship with my wife and my son, I believe that's when I decided to lie. But I'm not positive. You also left out when you had the GSR, too, because that's what you testified to yesterday. That certainly contributed. And your dope paranoia, too. You said that as well, correct? Well, those things are what triggered the paranoia that started as my addiction evolved. Right. And so 
you're an experienced lawyer and you've been a prosecutor and you took the advice of your law partners that you should have a lawyer there as you read that as, oh, I should lie. No, that's, that's not an accurate Because that's not what that means, is it, Mr. Murdoch? Well, that, that's, not a, that's, you're not, that's not an accurate statement, what you just said, Mr. Waters. I just repeated what you just said. You said it was one of the factors was your law partners and now you're blaming Sheriff Hill and, and Greg Alexander told you to, that you needed a lawyer before you talked to police and you took that somehow as meaning I need to lie? No. As a lawyer and a prosecutor? No, that's what you said, Mr. Waters. Right, but I, then, I, how I, am I mischaracterizing it from your perspective, Mr. Murdoch? Because I think that's, that, that, isn't that what you heard? Isn't that what you just said? Excuse me. No, sir. That's not what I said. All right. So, well, say it again. I believe those guys were trying to help me. I believe they cared about me. I believe they thought that I was in a condition such that I shouldn't talk to anybody. Um, I mean, I mean, those guys had to prop me up, help me get myself together just to be able to go talk to David Owens. I mean, they were trying to help me. But before that, that was just one of the many things that I believe led to that situation sitting in there where those paranoid thoughts came to me. Them talking about not talking to anybody without a lawyer, Brian Varnado checking my hands, the fact that I got a pocket full of pills in my pocket. Uh, I was the person who found Maggie and Paul. My distrust for SLED. Um, all of those factors combined and made me decide to lie. I also know him asking me about Maggie and Paul Paul contributed to that paranoia. All I'm saying is, I'm not disputing that I lied. I'm just saying at this point, you're saying I made a conscious decision to lie here, and I'm saying I don't think I made a conscious decision right there. Okay, so lighter? I believe so. Had you already had your GSR done at this point? Yes, sir. Okay. I had. And you already talked to your law partners and talked to and heard Sheriff Hill. Now you're blaming him and, and I'm not, blaming uh, no. Chief Alexander now as well for your lies. No, sir, Mr. Waters. Well, I'm you not just added that one. You didn't say that yesterday. You just yeah. added that one. Please be given the opportunity to Would answer the question. Objection. Finish your last answer. Right. Mr. Waters, I'm not blaming anybody. I accept full responsibility for what I did. What I'm saying is what I believe contributed to me doing that and the reason why I did that. I think those folks were trying to help me. So I don't blame them. I think they were worried about me. Okay. I don't dispute that, but you're saying you took that advice as I need to lie. No. Nah. What you're doing is you're isolating one single I'm thing. I'm not isolating anything. I've mentioned all the factors. You've added some new ones, but I mentioned all the factors that you're blaming for no, your sir. decision to lie. That's not what you did. What you asked me is you said I took, I took my partners telling me not to talk to somebody without a lawyer as a reason to lie. And that's an inaccurate statement. That was one of the factors that went into a Your series to lie. hang on, Mr. Waters, a series of events, all right, that caused me to have paranoid thinking, all right. And then I lied. All right. But at some point it happened during this interview that you, you crossed over. You're saying that you came into this interview intending to be fully disclosing to everything, and something happened in this interview that sent you over the edge. And you said, hey, let me lie about the last time I saw my wife and child alive, supposedly, according to me. I certainly didn't go into that interview. I believe intending to lie. Mr. Okay. Waters, I wasn't capable at that point in time of planning anything or thinking through anything. So somehow during this interview, all of a sudden those senses came to you to plan and do that. When I got 
to thinking in that paranoid way that normally, as I said, I mean, I could take a deep breath and make it go away. I never had a situation where it lasted more than a matter of seconds. That night, after all those things had happened, it, it didn't go away in a matter of seconds. And I decided to lie. Those are the uh, clothes that you ultimately gave to Dave Owen, is that right? Those are the clothes I gave to David Owen. At what point did you get, get, be able to chuck the pills you say are in your pocket? When did you do that? When I was in my bedroom. When you're in the bedroom? Yes, sir. Where'd you put them? I'm not sure where I put them, but ultimately they would have gone in my suitcase. So you, that's when you did it? Do you have a specific recollection of that? No, I don't. I just know that I took them out of my pocket. If we watch this whole video, you think you could, if we watch the whole thing, you think you can say, okay, that's the moment where our, my senses came to me and I decided I was going to tell this major lie? Mm, I, I, don't, I don't know that it happened like that, but I mean, I may be able to tell you some things that contributed to it. We watched the whole thing. Yeah, we've heard that. At least on this one, at some point during this interview, when you were able to plan your lie about this event, and you made that decision, and, but it wasn't what we just played. It wasn't yet. It was some point after that. I don't think that's a lie right there. Is is the reason why I don't think that it's occurred before this? Because what I'm saying there. I believe to be truthful, and I know, know I know this. I know for a fact that when David Owens asked me about my relationship with my wife and my child, I know that that played a role in that, and I believe that, and I may be wrong, but I believe that this was before that. You ever heard the expression, not telling the whole truth is the same as telling the lie? Sure I have. That's something you understood? as a lawyer and a, and a prosecutor? Yes. <clears throat> All right. State your full name for him, please. Richard Alexander Murdoch. Uh -uh. And it's going to be the last name, so I'll get it correct. M U R D A U G H. All right. And you go by Alec? Yes, sir. And date of birth, Mr. Murdoch? May 27, 1968. And give phone number for you. 803-942-1227. And sir, what was your name? Yeah, Danny Henderson. Okay. All right. Um, as I stated, I'm David Owen. And Laura Rutland with Collin County. I'm a sled. I hate to have to do this. I understand. Yeah. I totally yeah. understand. Yeah. So you don't you don't have any problem yeah. with it. So. You hadn't decided to lie right there, correct? I don't believe so. You told David Owen 
that you understood that he had to ask questions and you did what you need to do, correct? That is what I told him. Your Honor, this might be a good time for a break. Clock. Ladies and gentlemen, addressing the jury, we'll break until 2.15. We will go to the jury room. Please do not discuss the case. Murdoch, you may step down. You're not allowed to discuss your testimony with anyone during lunch. Uh, and Mr. Griffin, I will address whatever matter you want to place on the record when we return. Yes, sir. Your Honor, one second, wait, right before we All right, one second before everybody moves. So I guess everyone can be seated. Yes, sir. We'll be in recess to 1.15.
Uh, Mr. Griffin, you wanted to put something on the record? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Um, during cross-examination of Mr. Murdoch, um, he had testified that in relation to the financial crimes that he had tried to meet with the Attorney General's office and that on multiple occasions and that uh, and that he had from the get-go had always been willing to sit down with them. He was specifically talking about the financial investigation and the charges which he received as a result of those investigations. Following up to that questioning, I mean that answer, Mr. Waters then went to Mr. Murdoch's um, testimony and the information he provided about being down at the kennel and he said you had never provided that information to law enforcement and other people until today or yesterday. And Your, Your Honor, that is a direct violation of Dole v. Ohio where the Supreme Court said that cross-examining the defendant about his failure to have told an exculpatory story after receiving Miranda warnings at the time of his arrest is a due process violation. The court goes on to say the defendant's post-arrest silence cannot be used against him. It violates due process. And that's exactly what happened on cross-examination. So we want to, I want to make clear the grounds for objection. Also would like to move to strike the question, strike the act, answer, and get a curative jury instruction that they are not to consider any <coughs> failure of the defendant to come forward with exculpatory information after his arrest relating to the murder charges. Thank you. Mr. Waters. Uh, yes, sir, Your Honor. Uh, clearly this defendant has given statements on multiple occasions and that operates as a waiver under Doyle. Uh, additionally, my question was not so limited as Mr. Griffin says, and it was in fact the defendant who made a point of saying that he had repeatedly tried to talk and, and put that in issue, at which point uh, this was directly responsive to what he brought up. Uh, and uh, additionally, this was also all that was discussed were public statements of his counsel, who was an agent on his behalf and attributable to him. Uh, so there's no Doyle violation here. If Mr. Murdoch had claimed his right to silence uh, from the beginning and had kept that uh, throughout, then the state would be precluded from commenting on the exercise of his right to remain silent. But one thing we know about Mr. Murdoch is he has not remained silent at any point during this process, and he's the one that brought up this false claim that he had been begging to tell the Kennel story when, in fact, he did not do so till yesterday. Uh, Doyle primarily addresses the issue of post-arrest silence. If, a direct, if a, an accused is silent uh, following an arrest, then it's improper to comment on a, the post-arrest silence. Uh, it does not uh, allow a person, an accused or a person who's suspected uh, to give contradictory information or to voluntarily give a statement or to voluntarily give a misstatement, um, as has been acknowledged here. I do not find any Doyle violation and the record is protected. I certainly understand the uh, defense raising any and all possible issues and they can be raised and uh, you've done it here. The record is protected, but uh, all motions are denied. Let's bring the jury.
Very good. You may proceed. <clears throat> may I please call your honor? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Mr. Murdoch, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Get that mic up a little bit, please. Excuse me. Thank you. When we uh, left off, we were talking about at what point during that interview in the car with Dave Owen that you decided to start lying about the murders of your wife and son. I'm going to pick up this video real quick. Not going to play the whole thing, but I'm going to start from two minutes and nine seconds. Who will just start to talk, take your time? Um, like when I came back here, mm -hmm. I mean, I pulled up and I could see him, and, you know, I knew something was bad. I ran out. I knew it was really bad. And my, my boy over there, I could see it was... Trying to turn him over, and uh, I don't know, I figured it out. Um, uh, his cell phone popped out of his pocket. I started to try to do something with it, thinking maybe, but then I put it back down really quickly. Um, then I went to my wife, and I, uh, I mean, I could see. Mm -hmm. Did you touch Maggie at all? I did. I touched them both. Okay. I tried to take, I mean, I tried to do it as limited as possible, mm -hmm. but I, I tried to take their pulse on both of them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, um, you know, I called 911 um, pretty much right away, and she was very good. Um, <clears throat> I talked to her. Um, I told her I was going to get off the phone to call some family members. <coughs> I did that. Um, and, um... How many family members did you call? Him? I called my brother Randy. And I called my brother John. And I tried to call a little boy, real good friend that's right around the corner from here, but I didn't get him. Okay. <clears throat> what all was around um, Paul when you walked up? Blood. Any any other anything else? I mean, there was some body mm -hmm. things, yes, sir. I mean, like any other evidence? I know you said the phone fell out the pocket. Um, but did you see anything else that didn't belong or shouldn't belong or that wasn't part of Paul? No, sir. Not, no, not good. No, sir. How about Maggie? No, sir. You didn't see anything around them? What made you come out here tonight? Um, I went to... My mom's a late stage Alzheimer's patient. My dad's in the hospital. Um, my mom gets anxious when she does. I went to check on them and Maggie. Maggie's a dog lover. Okay. She fools with the dogs. And I knew she'd gone to the kennel. I was at the house. Just to be clear, you say you hadn't made the conscious decision to start lying about your wife and son's murder right there, correct? I, I don't believe so. Okay. Let's continue on. Mr. Waters, I can't, I can't tell you exactly when that decision occurred. Okay. You can't describe to the jury the moment you decided to lie about your wife's son and um, your wife and son's murder. 
I can't tell you exactly when that moment occurred. I left the house and went. But you did say earlier that when David Owen asked you about your uh, relationships, that was a trigger point, correct? Well, that was certainly one of the things that contributed or, or made me paranoid. Okay. Now, you know, there were already things that had gone on mm -hmm. that, that, that occurred, as I said, that put me in that mindset. Yeah. But exactly when I decided to, to lie about that, I can't tell you. So the things again you talked about your parent, your dope paranoia, uh, the fact they taken GSR, uh, and you talked about the advice of your law partners and Sheriff Hill and Greg Alexander, and then you talked about your distrust of Sled somehow from this the circumstances and demeanor of this interview right here, correct? No, my distrust from Sled didn't arise from this interview. My my distrust for Sled arose from a, a couple of things, and it's really several things. It, it yeah. arose from the way they had been involved in, SLED had been involved in the investigation into Paul's criminal charges, and uh, they had been involved in, there was an issue that had gone on with some rumors about Buster and Paul, they had been involved in that, where, um, you know, Buster nor Paul had anything to do with with what I'm talking about, and Sled would never Sled never said that, even though they told their lawyer that they never say that. Um, and there had been another incident where Sled had charged Greg Alexander, my 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 friend in this case, they charged him. And in fact, I thought the agent that was involved in that was David Owen, but the charges against Greg Alexander were so they, they were so wrong that my dad and I made a conscious decision, even though he was a career prosecutor, to made a decision to go to the courthouse and sit with Greg Alexander while his trial went on because it, it was about 10 years ago, right? It was a while back, yeah. you know? But they, you don't know if Dave Owen was at SLED 10 years ago. No, no, I, I, I checked on that because that night, the, the, the officer who was involved in that case in, in bringing clearly manufactured charges against Greg Alexander. Well, you're saying the night before you sat down for this interview, you were asking somebody about whether or not something about Greg Alexander 10 years ago in the wake of what had occurred? Oh, no, I didn't ask anybody. Okay, so that wasn't what you were discussing when you were sitting in. No, I wasn't discussing that. I'm just telling you that I thought David Owen was the same agent that was involved in that case. Now, I learned later, because I checked on it, I learned later that it was a different David sled agent, first name David with a different last name. I learned that later. I'm just saying that was all part of that process going on in my mind. So you're sitting, saying that you're sitting here right now thinking that this Dave Owen and this circumstances and demeanor of this interview, you're thinking that guy had been involved in the prosecution uh, or investigation of your friend 10 years ago? I did. Okay, so that, here's a new one you just mentioned to us, correct? No, that's not a new one. Okay. That's part of I mean, the circumstances are new. I mean, no, that's fairly no. specific, don't you think? Well, no, sir. I, I, I mean, the story I, keeps evolving. Keep going. Keep no, going. You, you asked me about this, Mr. Owen. What I said is part of this whole, I mean, Mr. Waters, the whole part of this whole process involved my distrust for SLED. That was part of, a big part of my distrust for SLED. Yeah, we can all see it on your face in this interview, can't we? I don't know. All right. But you said when what you just said a little bit ago, that wasn't the lie, that wasn't the conscious decision yet, so let's keep going. If we no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying I don't believe that it was. I don't okay. know exactly when right. I made the decision to lie about that. All right. All right. Well, if you see it, let me know, okay? I want to go forward. To my mom's <clears throat> for just a little while. Tried to call her when I left. Texted her. No response. Um, when I got back to the house, the house was obviously nobody was in there. So I figured they're still up here fooling around. Paul was 
going to be getting set up to plant. Our sunflower seeds got sprayed and died, and he was refiguring to do, to plant the sunflower seeds. So I came back up here and drove up and saw and called. Had Maggie and Paul been arguing over anything? No. What was their relationship like? Wonderful. Wonderful. How about yours and Maggie's? Wonderful. I mean, I'm sure we had little things here and there, but we had a wonderful marriage, wonderful relationship. And yours and Paul's relationship? As good as it could be. How old was Paul? 22. Okay. So that was the moment right there, that line of questioning. Just asking some very general questions about your relationship. You mentioned that before, didn't you, Mr. Murdoch? Is that the moment right there? Is that the look on your face when you decide to lie about an important fact in your wife and son's murder? I don't know. As I said, Mr. Waters, I don't know the exact point that I made that decision. You said earlier mentioned that very exchange is somehow triggering you to lie about the last time you saw them alive. Now, I'm not saying that that's what made me lie. I'm saying this whole set of circumstances mm -hmm. caused me to be in a state where I had paranoid thoughts. Mm -hmm. okay. That normally, Mr. Waters, I could take a deep breath and make go away in a second or two seconds or three seconds at the most. And on this night, I wasn't able to do that. But all of those things that I mentioned, I believe contributed to that. Okay. Any more you want to add now, since you keep adding them? I'd be glad to answer any question you have. Well, I mean, I'm asking you. I mean, we, the factors have gone from yesterday to today, and now even after lunch we got some new ones. So anything else you want to add right now as to factors? Mr. Woods, I don't believe that, I, that I've added any new factors. I believe that's what I said yesterday. All right. <clears throat> I've explained some of those factors because of your questions, but I don't believe I've added any factors. Okay. All right, let me move this forward just a little bit. Most of this was stuff from a couple of them, but not. yesterday in great detail about the boat case, which you brought up on the 911 call and to Daniel Green, and then, of course, in this first interview, correct? I did, I did mention right. the boat wreck. All right, and you described that. Do you remember what you said in this interview about the boat wreck? Not specifically. About specifically the other people involved in the boat wreck? You don't remember specifically? Do you remember specifically? I guess you said no. I remember talking about the boat wreck. And I don't know that I talked about the boat wreck. All right. Well, I'm going to play now from 1714. Any direct threats between any of the people on the boat okay. specifically, but I, I do think there's been a small amount of yip yap between a couple of them, but not recently. Okay. <clears throat> what was the term you used for that? A small amount of yip yap? Yeah, and just to be clear, Mr. Waters, there was never, ever a point in time where I thought that the people that were involved in the boat wreck mm -hmm. did this to Paul Paul and Maggie. Okay. I, I've never thought that. All right. I never thought that, but it's literally one of the first things that you said out of the 911 call. No, nah, that's not what I said. I never, ever, ever under any point in time believed that those kids that were riding in that boat or their parents or, or, their, or, or their families. Mm -hmm. I didn't believe that any of the families, the people that were involved in the boat wreck, had anything to do with hurting Maggie and Paul. Okay. But I can tell you that at that time, and as I sit here today, 
that I believe that boat wreck is the reason why Paul, Paul, and Maggie were killed. Okay. And I'm certain. So I believe it was, that. It was random vigilantes, the 5 2 vigilantes. So. No, what I believe, Mr. Waters, is I believe that when Paul was charged criminally, there were so many leaks, half truths, half reports, half statements, partial information, misrepresentations of Paul that ended up in the media all the time. And when I tell you the social media response that came from that was vile, the things that were said about what they would do to Papa, they were so over the top that nobody would believe anybody would get on social media and do that. But I believe then and I believe today that the wrong person the wrong person saw and read that. Because okay. I can tell you for a fact that the person or people who did what I saw on June the 7th, they hated Paul Murdoch and they had anger in their heart. And that is the only only reason that somebody could be mad at Paul Paul like that and hate him like that. Gotcha. All right, so we've got now. We've but got that's why the, the I did then believe it was the boat wreck, mm -hmm. and I believe now that the boat wreck All right, so we've had got, something to do with it. All right, so we've got random vigilantes because of the boat wreck. Now, I don't know that they're random vigilantes. Well, you just said it wasn't the family or the kid, or they're no. the kids or the family of the other kids in the boat, right? But so you're saying it's somebody off of social media. And you don't have any evidence of that, do you? Not you just believe that. You're just telling that jury that as you try to explain the lie that you told for the first time yesterday. Isn't that right? No, sir, that's not right. It's not right. <laughs> All right, well, let me ask you a question then. So what you're telling this jury is that it's a random vigilante. That's your the 12 year old, uh, The 12-year-old 5-2 people that just happened to know that Paul and Maggie were both at Moselle on June 7th that knew that they would be at the kennels alone on June the 7th, that knew that you would not be there, but only between the times of 8.49 and 9.02, that they show up without a weapon, assuming that they're going to find weapons and ammunition there, that they commit this crime during that short time window, and then they travel the same exact route that you do around the same time to Almeida. That's what you're trying to, to tell this jury? you got a lot of factors in there, Mr. Waters, all of which I do not agree with but some of which I do. <clears throat> All testified earlier that after this happened, well, let me back up just real quick. When you were driving to and from Almeida, why were you in such a hurry? Why, are you, why are you rolling 70, 80 miles an hour down that dark, beat up road? I wasn't in such a hurry. You weren't? No, sir. Show you what's been marked as states 573. See if you recognize this. I do. And tell the jury what that is. 
It's a nice car. Right. And what's it in front of? The house at Moselle. And what's between the house and the Mercedes? The golf cart. Is that where it was on June the 8th, to your recollection? Uh, no, sir. Where was it left? I mean, it was near there, but that's not exactly where it was, no, sir. Okay, where was it? Where we would normally park it would be a little bit closer to the um, shed. I mean, to a little bit closer to the, to the house, to the bushes. Okay. Your Honor, this... When was that photograph taken? Well, do you recognize when it was taken? No, I don't, I don't recognize. No, you sir. wouldn't dispute that it was around the time in the aftermath of the murders, would you? Aftermath being when? I'm asking you. A day, a week, an hour? I wasn't there, Mr. Murdoch. Do you, re do you recognize those? I recognize the car, I recognize the house, and I recognize the golf cart. But that is not, that's, that's not exactly how it would have been All right. that night. Can you, can you describe to me then where it would be different? Well, it would be more in line with, first things first is when we drove the golf cart, or when I drove it for sure, and I believe when the others drove it, you would come in and you would, you would go across the little brick walkway that's in front of this. So if, if I, I would have come in and gone this way, or I would have come in and gone this way. This is not a place that, that any of my family would have normally parked. And so what I'm assuming is this obviously is taken at daytime. Mm -hmm. And what I'm assuming is, is it was taken when SLED came to the, the earliest it was taken was when SLED came to the house the next day, which I believe the testimony is in the afternoon. And at this point in time, that golf cart, I would assume, would have been moved several times, but that's right. not how it was. Well, where did you leave the golf cart when you got out of it around 849? In the manner in which I just talked about. Okay. Well, help me out again so I understand. You, you would have come around this way or that way, but where was it? Where would it end up? It would up? have been, it, it, in, in this picture, is facing to the right. Oh, I got you. The, the night... The night that I drove it, I believe I parked it facing to the left. I understand. Would be customarily how I did it. And I believe I did it that way that night. Okay. Well, and, right. and, and that is how I would have gotten into it. All right. That's a very specific memory. Thank you. All right. At this well, time, the state would offer uh, states 573 and others. No objection. Admit it without objection. Can I be very briefly? <clears throat> And see, Mr. Waters, you can see in the picture now that you bring this up on the screen, if you look to the right, you can see the actual steps. And just to the left of that would be where the little brick patio starts. So where I would normally park it, you would roll across those bricks, and the end of the golf cart would be just past those. And we all normally parked it that way because the way you charge this golf cart is if you see that back seat, that's sitting, you, you can see the edge, this is a three seat golf cart, and you can see the back seat. And a lot of golf carts have the charger, this sits on the floor or something. This golf cart has a charger that's plugged in and a part of the golf cart. So you flip that seat up and it plugs in. And, this, and the outlets are right up there by the door. Okay. Anything else you wanna say about that? I'm going to answer any questions you have, Mr. Waters. Well, I appreciate all that information in great detail. <clears throat> Jake, you do the comment. Sustained. All right. It's just never parked that way by the family. Have the uh, computer back, please. That's up. <laughs> Mr. Murdoch, I'm going to put up the second interview.
This would have been June the 10th. I'm not going to play the whole thing, but I do want to go through a couple of things with you, okay? Anything you want to go through, Mr. Waters? I apologize, got ahead of myself. I want to do one last thing on the first one. For the record, I'm gonna start. Um, I forget the guy's name. I'm gonna start it at 23:55. This is the first interview. Amy has been having trouble with her. She's been having trouble with her stomach and her tooth. I'm not positive. It was sort of a routine visit, and I can't remember. She told me the name of him, and I can't. I want to say Gordine, Gordine, Gordine okay. is um, who I think she saw. So was she back home around supper time, or, um, or six o'clock, seven o'clock? I don't think she got back quite that early. I think she got back a little bit later than that. Okay. Um, and what did you do today? Were you in the office or? No, I was home. I came home. Paul and I messed around. I, I, uh, I was up at the house. I laid down, took a nap on the couch, probably, I don't know, 25, 30 minutes. I got up, I called Maggie, didn't get an answer, and I left to go to my mom's. She had said she might ride with me, but she normally doesn't when I go over there. Um, and I think I texted her. There, when you repeated the lie that you decided. Was that the moment that I decided? Was that the moment you decided to lie to mean old Dave Owen? I don't, I don't know. As I told you, Mr. Waters, the exact moment that I decided to lie. But at that point in time. But you did lie there, correct? I did. And she's very good about answering the phone, so that was odd, or calling me back. So that was odd, but it wasn't that big a deal. All right, I'm going to go to the second interview. It's been previously admitted. Let me ask you this before we start. You say that earlier during your direct testimony that after these crimes happened, you were around family, family was around you, your law partners around you pretty much every minute after that, correct? Every waking minute. Didn't you say that yesterday? Yes, they were for a, a long time. All right. And this second interview was three days later, is that right? That's correct. And in no time with any of your close friends and law partners and family, do you confess the truth? Do you? No, I did not. Do you say, hey, man, I, I think I messed up? 
what should I do about this? No, I didn't. You're not telling that lie to anyone, are you? Until yesterday. Excuse me? You're not telling that lie to anyone until yesterday, are you? Not telling what lie? <clears throat> Saying I tried to tell somebody that I was lying? to approximately 2456. I'm at 1228. Him, he doesn't like to go to doctors. Making him go get his blood pressure checked. His feet had swollen up recently. Wow. So, you know, that was it, it was, a, it was a, a big, huge deal. Okay. Uh, you know, we hung around the house for a little while. Uh, I know that Maggie went to the kennels. Um, I don't know exactly where Paul went, but he left the house too. Okay. How did Maggie get down to the kennels? I don't know exactly. But on normal occasions, she would drive, drive a buggy, drive a four-wheeler, or very common for her to walk. Okay. How about Paul? What's... Paul wasn't much of a walker, but he would use all of the others. Okay. Um, but, it, it, I mean, it could be anyway, okay. you know? I'm, I don't know exactly. <clears throat> I wish I could help you with that. So, so they left and went down to the kennels. Well, Maggie went to go to the kennels. Okay. And, Paul, and Paul left. And I'm assuming, you know, I'm assuming Paul left okay. because of, you know, gotcha. what happened. I mean, I'm assuming Paul yeah, yeah. went to the kennels. Okay. Um, and what did you do when, once Maggie and Paul left? I stayed in the house. Okay. And I was watching TV, looking at my phone, and I actually fell asleep on the couch. Okay. And what time did you? You know, I don't know exactly what time I woke up, but when y'all get my phone, you know, I think one of the first things I did when I got up was call Maggie mm -hmm. because I was going to my mom's. Mm -hmm. um, and I know I texted her because I checked my phone. And what time did we say the text was, Jim? Like 9.06? I didn't see it. Yeah, I, I got it written down for me. I night. showed you the other yes, night, yes, didn't I? Yes, sir. I got this. So, you know, I texted her, so I called her just before that. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, she she didn't answer at that point, um, and I left to go to my mom's. Okay. <laughs> Y'all just have to look. I, I don't, yeah. I'm not sure if I called Paul well, or Well, and, and, that, and that's why we're getting the phone, so we can nail down the times and, right. and, and everything. Pretty much all of that was lies, wasn't it? The part about me not being at the kennel was a lie. Well, also, not knowing that Paul went down there, not being sure, that was a lie too, wasn't it? I mean, you're putting some detail on this thing, no, aren't you? Not knowing when Paul left. I, everything about me not going to the kennel was a lie. And you're able to just do that Mag just so easily and so convincingly and so naturally, don't you? I mean, that's not for me to judge. That's true. It's an odd story. I'm going to get to where I'm going. 
going. Do it right now. So do y'all have any good clues? So we're trying to put a rush on that to get an answer quick and hoping that's going to tell us something. By Evans, I mean, is it things you think are going to be helpful? Well, I mean, like the shot shells out there, the casings, the DNA swabs that we took from the door handle to see if anybody touched the door handles, any other places that we think somebody may have touched while they were out there. You know, we're trying to collect DNA from that and analyze that, which at the conclusion of this, what I'm going to also ask is that we get a buckle swab, a DNA swab from you. Your DNA is going to be there, but we need to eliminate it once it's developed. So, you know, we don't need that unknown when it actually is a family member. There's no problem. I mean, we have talked to close to 100 people trying to track people down, and we're still tracking people down. And that's why, you know, who Paul was with. I want to tell you one thing while I'm thinking about it. Paul was really an incredibly intuitive little dude. And, I mean, he was like a little detective. He was like a little detective. Is that what you said? That is what I said. And he was very intuitive, like I said. And that was what Marion described as Maggie's term for how he was and keeping tabs on your pill usage. Wasn't that correct? That was what Maggie said about him. For some reason, you decided to bring that up in this interview, didn't you? I mean, that was a trait of Paul's personality. I mean, I think anybody who knew him would tell you how intuitive he was. All right. For the record, I'm at 4630. Well, thank you all very much. So, Mr. Allen. You don't have to call me, miss. You just call me. Thank you for that. When you and Paul got back in the house, Miss Maggie's there, and y'all eat supper, which has been prepared. And you said you laid down and took a little nap. And when you got up, Maggie and Paul was gone. Or did they leave when you laid down? I believe that I'm not sure. But they weren't there when you woke up around the 9 o'clock mark or so when you made the call to Maggie to let her know you were going to eat supper. No. Nobody was in that house when I left. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just trying to narrow down. The last time that Paul and you saw Paul and Maggie is when y'all were eating supper. Yes, sir. Okay. Your answer was yes, sir. Is that correct? That's correct.
about to go to the August 2021 interview, but between that June 10th interview and the August interview, you were not working very much, is that correct, if at all? No, I, I definitely wasn't working very much. I, I think I was working a little bit, but no, not very much at all. Did you go to Johnny Parker to borrow $250,000 in order to cover the Ferris fee fees? So I did. You did? I did. Did you tell him what that was for? No, I did not tell him what that was for. Did you go to Russell Lafitte at Palmetto State Bank and get $350,000 in order to help cover some of the Ferris fees that you had taken to send to Chris Wilson? I did. And did you get those fees before you signed any paperwork or documentation? I've heard testimony about that in this case, but I, I, can't, I can't tell you the specifics of that. Okay. You don't recall that? Do I recall when I signed paperwork? No, sir. You don't recall that you got the money a month before you had to sign any paperwork? No, sir, I don't recall that. Recall your phone being in the console. Which I'm not disputing that. that, but I don't recall it. All right. Did you go to your best friend, Chris Wilson, and convince him to cover $192,000, the remaining $192,000, in order for him to send that email to your law firm as if those fees had been there all along? I spoke to Chris Wilson and did not have the full amount of the fees, and I got Chris Wilson to put the remaining fees in his trust account. And when you did that, you didn't tell him the truth about your life. You just asked him to cover you, correct? No, I, didn't, I did not tell him. And he agreed to do that because of his belief of who you really were or who he thought you were. He agreed to do that for whatever reason. I assume that was a big part of it. And once that $600,000 was transferred, Chris Wilson sent an email to you saying those fees had been there, were in his trust account, correct? That, that is correct. And then you forwarded that email to Lee Cope and Jeannie Seconder, correct? I know I forwarded it to Jeannie, and I've heard that testimony about forwarding it to Lee Cope, so I believe that's correct. Because at that time, there were limitations on how much I could borrow because MAGS was passed. And so I was limited. I couldn't get a loan against Moselle and had to get a loan against Palmetto State. I mean against uh, Edisto. Go on to the third interview. go to Apparently having some technical difficulties.
jury's seen this. So, I mean, again, you repeated the same lies over and over again. I did. Effortlessly and convincingly. I don't know about that. Well, they can see it there. I agree with that. Nobody yelled at you. Nobody yelled at me. Nobody, nobody, none of these guys were ever discourteous to me. Like, nobody what? I said none of those guys were ever discourteous to me. Okay. You made a comment earlier that David Owens was mean or something about being mean, and he was never mean to me. But you decided to lie in part because you distrusted David Owen. I distrusted SLED in general, mm -hmm. and I particularly distrusted who I thought was David Owen at the time. Okay. Who turned out not to be David Owen. So, wait a minute. I want to be clear. You're saying now you thought that this was the, some David Owen that had something to do with Greg Alexander 10 years ago. No, sir. And I'm not saying that now. I said, I've said that all along. Uh -huh. The person that I saw and watched in Greg Alexander's trial that was clear to me was just, it, it, was, it was terrible what they did to Greg Alexander. And the person at SLED who was responsible for that was a guy named David. Mm -hmm. All right? And I'm not even getting to his last name. I thought that David Owens that night was that guy. Later, down the road, and it was a while, I checked into that, and I found out that I was mistaken, that it was not David Owen. So when we went back day. and we spent a lot of time going through that first statement, you're telling me now that you were sitting there thinking that this was a completely different guy the whole time, and that was on your mind during that entire interview. Yes, at the time, well, that, right. I thought that David Owen, no, I didn't think David Owen was a different person. I thought that David Owens was the person that my dad and I had watched mm -hmm. just, I mean, my dad and I truly thought evidence yeah, was manufactured and, and I thought it was David Owen mm -hmm. and I was wrong about that. Okay. But that's what I thought that night. Any other factors or details you want to add about your decision? You know? I want to answer any question you have, no, Mr. No, Waters. I mean, uh, you know, any more? Do you have any more questions, sir? No, I mean any more about your decision to lie. I mean, I, I just want to let's get it all out now. Okay. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer, sir. All right. Well, I do. Tell me about the uh, replacement blackout. You initially told law enforcement that you weren't sure whether or not there was one, correct? Correct. Oh, no, sir, you're absolutely wrong about that. Mm -hmm. what, did, what did you say then? Shortly after this, it, it became being uh, told that Paul's gun had been stolen. Mm -hmm. And uh, the one you heard talk about being stolen from the thing. And I'm not sure how I learned this, but I learned that somebody... I believe SLED had gone to John Bedingfield, who made those guns, and could only find paperwork for two blackouts, one of which they were saying was stolen in 17. And that's what they were telling me. And I was certain and told them that I was certain that there was a third one. But initially, in, in June 8th and June 10th, or June 10th, you were saying that you thought that y'all had replaced it, and then you kind of wavered and then eventually said you did replace it, correct? I don't believe that's correct, no, sir. You don't sir. believe I, that's correct? No, I don't believe that's correct. Did you correct. say to law enforcement that you thought that the third gun, the replacement blackout, had gone missing in Christmas of 2020? The, it did go missing in Christmas of 2020. So you're telling them that one also had been missing six months prior, correct? When, you answer my question first, and then you can explain did you all tell law enforcement that that gun had been missing since Christmas time? I told law enforcement that when we looked for it at Christmas time, mm -hmm. we could not find it. Okay. And that was, that was accurate. We, we looked for it when we were trying to shoot hogs, when we had a, a, a group of people out there, mm -hmm. and we could not find it. Okay. But you now know that it was there as late as turkey season. I know, sir. I know that Will Lovin and Paul Paul had it right before turkey season, like Will Lovin testified to. Okay. 
So it was around, actually. It was around there at some point in time there, yes, sir. So you're saying it got stolen a second time, or you just don't know? No, I'm not. The 12-year-old stole it a second time? I never said a 12-year-old stole any gun, or, Mr. Sorry, Waters. the 5'2 people stole it a second time? I don't know that it was stolen. I just know that when we looked for it at Christmas time, we couldn't find it. And I know this. I know that I hadn't seen that gun in a long time. I've heard the testimony that people who were at my house using guns and hunting with us all the time, Rogan, uh, Buster, they didn't, I can't remember about Buster, but there were several people who didn't even know that gun had been replaced. So that tells me that that gun did not stay where our regular guns were. And I know that I didn't see it there, and that tells me that they didn't see it there. Of course you didn't see it there, because it's got to be missing, right, Mr. Murdoch? Ask that yeah, question one again. One more circumstance for your latest story to work is that it's got to be missing as well. It was when you told law enforcement it was missing at Christmas time. Now we've had testimony at this trial, and now you're, you're, you're still claiming that you never saw it. It must have been kept somewhere else. Where else would it have been kept? It could have been kept anywhere, Mr. Waters, the way Paul did guns, the way guns were handled around there. I was terrible about that. You are terrible about that. I should have been stricter. But you know that that third gun was fired right outside the gun room door in turkey season of 2021, correct? I know that now, based on what Will Lovin said. And you know it was also fired across the street at y'all's shooting house around that same time, don't you? No, sir, I don't know that, but I know that it, I would assume that it was fired, um, at the shooting range, but I have no, I don't, I don't have any reason to believe it was done in close proximity to that time. months go by, a couple months go by, and you get confronted about your thefts from the law firm, correct? September of 21. And unlike June the 7th, when Jeannie confronted you, this time they had unassailable evidence, correct? Yeah, that, that's correct. I mean, they had... No wiggling out of this one, correct? I didn't try to wiggle out of this one. Well, you've been wiggling before, though, right? You wiggled when you stole your brother's money twice, correct? Well, I, I admit almost all of these things, Mr. Waters, but that's one of the things that I take dispute with. Which one? That I stole that money that you're referring to. You, you, you're going to dispute that? Let's hear about that then. Tell me why you dispute passion that check twice. I don't dispute cashing that check twice. But you're going to tell this jury that you accidentally didn't realize that you were supposed to be receiving some $125,000 check or hundred and twenty however thousand dollar check two times. Um, what How I'm many hundred twenty thousand dollar checks do you receive? I got that check, and, and, and this is several months after. I mean, you can look at my finances, and you can, you can see how I was doing. I, n I didn't balance a checkbook. Um, but the fact of the matter is, when I got that check, I asked about it. And I was told, mistakenly, that, that it was for me that I had, I had done participated in that year-end thing, which I did sometimes, not often, but sometimes. Apparently, a new check got cashed. I cashed that check. Then a year later... Yeah, where did you keep that one for a year? 
I don't, I don't know where it was. It was obviously in my desk. But, Mr. Waters. So you found it in your desk? No, I, I didn't find it. Well, you say it was obviously in your desk. So you remember that? You remember finding it in your desk? No, I remember when we. Did you go to finance and say, I just found this year old check? Is this right? No. No, you took when, it to the bank, didn't you? No, sir. I didn't. Not allowing Mr. Murdoch to answer the question. So when this came up, when, when this came up, that check got cashed. There's no way that I can have a check in our law firm with the way accounting is and that I can cash a check twice and think that, that that's impossible. So to, to cash a check that's already been checked, it's going to throw, there's no question it's going to throw that off. What happened is I had a no, we used to get a rent check, we'd get little checks, I'd have checks, and they'd pile up the small checks. That check got mixed in and it got sent to the bank and it got deposited. Keep going. And that was a year after. Okay. But I do dispute that I stole that money. That money. All right. Well, I mean, you brought it up. So any, any of the other money you dispute, see them? No, no, sir. You brought it up. I was just telling you that that was the one I disputed. Okay. All right. And you heard Ronnie Crosby and Mark Ball testify about that, correct? I heard Ronnie and Mark testify about what they thought about it. Yes, sir. All right. Um, testified yesterday about the side of the road yeah yes sir and then you heard the testimony during the state's direct case about what you said on the 911 call you heard that didn't you? I did hear that you heard the 911 call where you said you've been attacked by an unknown assailant and described him I did and you saw the video from the ambulance where you said you'd been attacked by an unknown assailant and described him? I did. And you heard the testimony from Ryan Kelly, where you, again, went into detail and described this attack from an unknown assailant? I did. And you heard the testimony about your interview on September 6th with law enforcement, in which you went into great detail and, again, described this unknown assailant? I did. And you heard the testimony, and in fact, the image was put in about how you sat down with a sled sketch artist and spent a period of time with her going forward and creating an image of the supposed assailant. I did sit down with her. I, I, I was in the hospital, and they came in, sat down with me, asked me a bunch of questions. Mm -hmm. I answered their questions. And yes, you did. You it sat came there. To a, it came up with a composite. Yes, sir. Sat there and answered their questions just as effortlessly and convincingly as you've been trying to do for the past two days. Isn't that correct? No, sir. That's that's not true. In that hospital, I was, I was. I mean, it, it, I couldn't sit still. I was standing up. I was walking around. I, I was using the bathroom with the lady sitting right there. I was, you know, I was. Two days into not taking, three days into not taking pills like I had been. So no, it wasn't effortlessly. But I mean, I told them what I told them. I don't dispute that I it lied. Was, it was all lies, though, is the point, correct? It was. I mean, you're saying withdrawals, but you still were able to pull off lies in great detail. Correct? I lied to them. And the lie that you told of an unknown assailant was to try to make people think that the, quote, real guy, bad guys were back again to finish the job. Isn't that true? No, sir, that's not true. That's not the effect that you intended that story to have? 
did it have that effect on people that you knew? I Isn't that the exact effect that it had? I don't, I don't, I don't think there's many people that believe that. No, sir. I know the people that were, I mean, the, the, the people that were closest to me didn't believe that. So, no, when no, sir. accountability is at your door, Mr. Murdoch, bad things happen. Don't. Isn't that true? When accountability when is at my doorstep, life, go ahead. Bad things happen. What do you mean by bad things? June seventh happened. September fourth happened. I don't believe that June seventh happened because accountability issues were at my doorstep. Now I do believe in September that I tried to get a man to help me kill myself because issues were at my doorstep. Every time, or I'm sorry, for the first time in your life of privilege and prominence and wealth, when you were facing accountability, each time suddenly you became a victim and everyone ran to your aid. Isn't that true? I mean, I disagree with that, but... I mean, you're, you, what you're, Shame for you're, you is you're an in, extraordinary provocation. Isn't that true, Mr. Murdoch? Hang on, let me just finish this. You, you, you seem to be implying two dates, June the 7th and September, and talking about accountability issues. And, I mean, those, to me, those two things are totally different. There were no accountability issues on my doorstep on June the 7th. That's what you say. And in September. Not what other people say. I was trying to, well, no, I mean, there been a lot of people, well, on, in, in September, that wasn't designed to gain me sympathy. That was designed for me not to be here because I didn't want my son to have to deal with the wake of the things that I had done. But that's not the story you told. The story that came out of your mouth right away was the story of you getting attacked by some unknown assailant while you were trying to change a tire and run flats. Well, that's, that's the story that you told. That is the story I told, but that's because the man who shot me did not shoot me that day as I intended. And I had, a, I had to have a story as to how I got shot, so I lied. So you lied. And you're saying that people in your family and your friends didn't instantly believe that whoever these 12-year-old marauders were were back to finish the job. You keep using And it happened just two hours after you had been confronted by Chris Wilson. I think probably some people may have thought that when it first happened, but... I think like Randy, Ronnie, Mark, those guys, I think they knew very quickly that this was not, uh, this, I think they knew this was something that I'd done. Shame for you, I asked this before, but shame for you is an extraordinary provocation, isn't it, Mr. Murdoch? Shame for me is an extraordinary provocation. I don't like to be shamed. The prospect of humiliating the legacy is an extraordinary provocation to you, isn't it, Mr. Murdoch? What do you mean by an extraordinary provocation? It, it affects you deeply. It's your biggest concern, is it not? No, that's not my biggest concern. You're a middle-aged man like me? I'm 54 years old. I'm not sure. You look like you're in better shape than me, so I don't know. 
I was actually a couple of years behind you in law school, but we never knew each other, did we? I never knew you, no, sir. Had a very successful career up until this point. You know, simple question. And the answer to that is no, Mr. Waters. I was an addict for more than 20 years. All right, so, out, so making millions of dollars over over a decade is not having a successful career? Is that what you're going to tell the jury? No, that's not a successful career when you... Okay, well, let me put it no, like this. No, hang on. Let me, let me just... All right, go ahead. This, you know, it, it may have been what you perceive as a successful career, but, you know, I was the one who was fighting that. You don't have a very high self-esteem when you're an addict. So I, I don't deem myself a success. Would you agree that at least outwardly you were perceived as successful? I made I made I made a bunch of money if that's what you're wanting to, to, to get at. No, I'm actually asking about the perception. You were perceived as a prominent, I tried powerful to be. lawyer. How I was perceived. You were president I don't of the know. trial lawyers. I sure tried to be. You lived a life of possessing authority. Possessing authority? Yeah, we saw the badges. You just admitted of your prominence in the legal community. I don't think that I lived a life of possessing authority. I never saw myself as that way. You don't think you lived a life of privilege? I think I was very privileged. But as we move to June of 2021, you were suffering from a drug addiction? Absolutely. Your father was terminally ill? When? In, I mean, as we move to June of 2021? No, sir. He, he, he was very ill. He was very ill. And you were coming to a point of financial crisis. I, I, was, I was having financial issues like I'd had many times in the past. Mr. Murdoch, are you a family annihilator? A family annihilator? You mean like, did I shoot my wife and my son? Yes. No. I would never hurt Maggie Murdoch. I would never hurt Paul Murdoch. Under any circumstances. Say that. Excuse me? You say that, but you lied to Maggie, didn't you? I did lie to Maggie. You lied to Paul? Sometimes. You lied to your father? I'm sure I did at some point. Did you tell him all the stuff you'd been up to over the years before he died? No, I didn't tell him. Did you lie to your brothers? About financial things? Yes. I would have lied to Randy at some point, I'm sure. Did you lie to him about the last time you saw your wife and son alive? I did. Did you lie to their wives? I'm sure I did. Did you lie to Marion Proctor? Yes. Did you lie to Bart Proctor? Yes. Did you lie to the Brandstutters? Yes. Did you lie to your best friend, Chris Wilson? Probably. Did you lie to your other friend Barrett Bulware when you took his money? No, sir. No. Not I, I didn't lie like I told you. I didn't lie directly to him. I lied to him by omission, like like we talked about. I mean, he was he 
I, I didn't talk to him. I didn't see him at that time. Did you lie to your law partners? I did. Did you lie to him about the kennels? Some of them. Did you lie to Mark Ball? Uh, yeah, I believe, based on what Mark said, I believe I did. Did you lie to Ronnie Crosby? According to what he said, I believe I did. Do you lie to Johnny Parker? I don't believe I ever discussed that with Johnny. Did you lie to him about the finances when you borrowed that money in July of 2021? Um, I don't know if I lied to him about. I, I, I don't, Johnny. I don't think Johnny asked me. I don't think I had to lie to Johnny about that. So I don't know. Did you lie? Well, you didn't, certainly didn't disclose to him the truth when you borrowed that $250,000, did you? I did not tell him what I was going to use it for. I mean, didn't we have to say before that not telling the whole truth is the same as telling the lie? Sure it is. You don't think that's a lie, though? I don't. I'm just saying, Mr. Waters, I'm not taking issue with that, but I, I don't even know that Johnny and I, I mean, Johnny had loaned me money numerous times. It wasn't any long sit-down discussion where Johnny wanted to know exactly what I was doing with it. That conversation would have been, I needed it. Johnny was always willing to help me, and that would have been the conversation. So on that specific event, did I lie to him? I don't know. Yeah, and he ended up being out $477,000, didn't he? He ended up being out a lot of money. And thank you for your qualifications as to that. Did you lie to Lee Cope? I don't know. I don't, don't know, know if Lee Cope was around when I said that or not. Did you lie to Danny Henderson? I did lie to Danny. Did you lie to Jeannie Seconder? I don't About finances? Yes, I did. You don't ever, didn't ever talk to her about the kennels? No, I wouldn't think so. Did you lie to Annette Griswold? I did. Did you lie to Christy Gerald, your other secretary, or paralegal? I don't believe she and I discussed. That would have at some point, I'm sure. Did you lie to Michael Gunn? I'm sure I did at some point, but I mean, Michael wasn't involved in any of this, so I don't know that any of this ever came up with Michael. Did you lie to your clients? Did you lie to Pamela Pinckney? I did. Natasha Thomas? I don't know that I dealt with Natasha, but I certainly lied about that. Hakeem Pinckney? Again, I don't know that I talked to Hakeem, but I certainly lied about that. Arthur Badger? I did. The Plyler Girls? That's, I, I'm not sure that I talked specifically to them, but I lied about that. Dion Martin? I lied to Dion. Johnny Bush? Yes. Manuel Cristiani? I, I didn't have any conversations with him, but I certainly lied about it. Jamie and Richard? Yes. Randy Drotty. Yes. Jordan Jinks. Yes. Mary Duncan. Yes. Adriana Hay. Yes. Angel Gary. Yes. Christopher Anderson. Yes. Elise Mallory. Yes. Thomas Moore. No. You never lied to him? You just took his money. You never had to actually lie to his face is what you're saying? Uh, he and I never had a conversation, but I did take that I did take those that money. Did you lie to Tony Satterfield just a couple of months before June seventh? Um We saw the text. You want me to get it out? Just just remind me. There's been a lot. Just remind me what it was. Show you what's been marked as 463. And I don't remember the exact date, so. That was in April of 2021, is that right? Or you text him and tell him how hard you're working on the case when in fact you had stolen millions of dollars from him? I Tony did. Satterfield, who got up on the stand and told the jury about that? I texted him on April 12th, so five weeks before um, June 7th. Told him everything was okay. You're working hard, right? It's a complex case. 
Yeah, I told him I was working on the case. He was the son of your longtime housekeeper, Gloria. I'm sorry? He was the son of your longtime housekeeper, Gloria, who had served your family for many years. That's correct. And you stole millions from those boys. I, I stole those funds. And he and his family had started asking questions as we moved to June 7th. Didn't that happen? No. I mean, there wasn't any rise in them asking questions, no, sir. I mean, he periodically checked in and asked me questions, but, you know, it, it had come out long before this, I believe, in the island packet that there had been a settlement of $500,000. But, I mean, that had been months and months, if I'm not mistaken. And so I didn't notice any uptick in Tony asking questions, and I don't believe that there was any uptick in Tony asking questions before June the 7th. So you just, just gratuitously out of the blues decided to lie to him and send that text? Or were there things going on externally that caused you to need to head him off at the pass before further questions started to be asked about money you couldn't pay back at that point? No, nah, I don't think there was anything. I mean, in, in, on April 21st, I don't, don't know what external factors you're talking about. Do you want to explain that one anymore? Explain what? Whatever you want. I just want to answer your questions, Mr. Waters. Lied to everyone about the side of the road, the people that came to stop the help and the ambulance folks and uh, the 911 and Ryan Kelly and the, comp the composite sketch artist and all of them, correct? I lied to a lot of people about that. You know why people lie, Mr. Murdoch? Because they know they've done something wrong. For the most time I do. You've been able to lie quickly and easily and convincingly if you think it'll save your skin for well over a decade. Isn't that true? I have lied well over a decade. And you want this jury to believe a story manufactured to fit the evidence that you brought forth just yesterday after hearing this trial's worth of testimony? No, sir, that's not correct. Mr. Murdoch, we went through this for a while, but you remember at the beginning of your testimony, I asked you whether or not you agreed that trying to explain your presence on the kennel video was the most important part of your testimony before this jury. You remember that? And you said, oh, not the most important. I said, was it at least important? Do you recall that from yesterday? Yeah, I recall you asking those questions, yes, sir. And you agree it's important, don't you? I agree that is an important component. But I think there's a lot of important components. And you? testified yesterday and during cross yesterday and cross today it's kind of evolved on the fact of the factors that led you to decide to lie at some point during that interview with David Owen correct I disagree with that no, no, I don't think those factors have evolved I mean you've asked some more specific questions but those factors are still the same factors you you, you may have asked questions and gained a little more detail, but those factors haven't changed. But it was the dope paranoia. It was the fact that the deputy took your GSR. 
It was the fact that your law partners and Greg Alexander and the sheriff were telling you you needed to have a lawyer before you talked to police. It was a factor that you got in the car with Dave Owen and thought he was somebody else from some case 10 years ago, correct? That believing David Owens was the person involved in the case that I talked about was one of the factors that caused me to distrust SLED. All right. And then also you said that they started exactly. asking you about, in that first interview, about your relationship with Maggie and Paula. And that you, that's one thing you mentioned as well, correct? And that was certainly something that contributed to me having paranoid thinking. And the Daniel Green body cam video, 2026. Before that. That was Sergeant Green, correct? That, yeah, that was Sergeant Green. And at that point in time, SLED was not there. No one had been, gotten GSR from you. Your law partners or Sheriff Hill were not there. That's correct. No one had asked you about your relationships. David Owen was not there. That's correct. But you still told the same lie. And all those reasons that you just gave this jury about the most important part of your testimony was a lie too. Isn't that true, Mr. Murdoch? I, I disagree with that. Nothing further. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll take a break now. Please do not discuss the case.
may step down. Please do not discuss the case. We'll take 15 minutes. All rise. All rise.
be seated. You may bring the jury. All right, thank you. Redirect. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Murdoch, we spent a long time yesterday and a fair amount of time today talking about financial misdeeds. Yes, sir. Have you been criminally charged? for the, those financial crimes? I have been. And you have pending charges again? I do. Okay. You, um, you were asked specifically about $792,000 in Ferris fees that, um, that you diverted from the law firm. Do you recall that? Yes, sir. And, and I think you were asked about an accounting or, or, or where that money went, and it went out pretty quickly. Roughly? Yes, sir. And you recall testimony that over $500,000 went to Curtis Eddie Smith? I do. And what would that have been for? That would have all been for pills. For opioids? Yes, sir. Specifically, and all I was taking at that time was oxycodone and oxycontin. And you were, um, you were an addict, were you not? I am an addict. You are an addict. And did you repeatedly lie to those you love to cover up your addiction? I did. And were you concerned that you would um, you would be exposed if you didn't continue to lie about your conduct? I did. There are some specific things you were asked about, which I'd like to go over. Um, one, one thing you had referred to a text message that you'd seen later on um, between Maggie and Blanca. Do you recall that? I do. Um, and and it's in the evidence as Defendants Exhibit 54. And Doug, if if you could pull that up, please, sir. And if you could um, highlight the the Blanca text. Is this the text message you're referring to? It is. And um, and I'll just read it. It says, T.Y., does that, that thank you? It says, T.Y., I'm waiting at Dr. Alex wants me to come home. I had to leave door open at Edisto, but trust Mexicans to shut a lot for me. His dad is back in the hospital. The last doctor claims not cancer, it pneumonia. And then she has some, some faces. Alex is about to die. Hope he doesn't go down there to sleep. Alex needs to take care of himself as well. Is that the text message you're referring to? Yes, sir. And did Blanca share this message with you after Mag Maggie was murdered? Blanca first, ultimately she shared that with me. She first told me 
that, you know, Maggie was worried about me, how much she loved me, and that she was worried about me, and had texted her. Okay. Now, you were um, asked, you can take it down, Doug. You were asked questions about um, conversations uh, around the dinner table on, on, on the 7th about, well, didn't eat at the table, but around where you're eating dinner about, about Paul's um, health. Is that correct? That, that is correct. Two exhibits, defendants 179 and 180, and ask if you can identify these two. Can I can? And what are they? Um, it's text from um. Um, let's see, it's a text from Paul Paul to me on May the 30th. And then, uh, and what's, what's 180? Exhibit 180 behind it. That's a picture of Paul Paul, Paul Paul's feet. Your Honor, we've moved defendants exhibits 179, 180 into evidence at this time without objection, I believe. Without objection, Your Honor. Submitted. Well, look, do you have 179? We've got to put it on. Let me put it on the Elmo. Okay. Alan, do these, uh, this text message refer to Paul's feet swelling? They do. So if you'll do, you can pull it up. All right, go up a little more so we can read it. And it says, um, from Paul, and, and that phone number, is that your phone number? That is. It's my phone number, 1227. My feet swole up. It has something to do with my blood pressure. Get me an appointment as soon as it's convenient. And what's the, what's the date of this? May, thir- May, May the 30th. 2021, right? Yes, sir. And if, Doug, if you'll show the picture... I believe this is a blow up of the picture that's in this exhibit 180. Can you pull out? Is that a picture of that Paul had sent you of his feet swelling up? It is. Is this what y'all discussed, you know, when you're eating dinner? Yes. Okay. Along and, with many other times. You'd also. Um, You were asked questions about um, your your dad's condition and whether he was terminal or not. Do you remember that? I do remember questions about him. Okay, and um, gosh, Doug, I, I think it's um, the extended timeline. Is it states five thirty? Is that the right number? States 520, if you'll pull it up, please. It's in, already in the evidence. And if you'll go to page 14, and if you'll blow up the the uh, the entry at 142.54 at the bottom of the page. Alex, is this a um, text that that you and and, and will do you recall uh, this is the text that, that you and other family members received about your father's condition? Yes, sir. Okay, and it says, Daddy was just seen by the pulmonologist in Savannah. His opinion is dramatically different from the other doctors. He thinks Daddy has pneumonia and needs to be hospitalized to be treated for pneumonia. He thinks there could be an obstruction, but is more confident that it 
then it is all or mostly pneumonia. Daddy is being admitted to Candler St. Joseph Hospital now. He will have a study done to see whether or not there is an obstruction and his treatment will be tailored accordingly. Right now, his pulmonologist does not. Um, go to the next page. Does not believe that he'll be getting radiation treatment, and in fact, the pulmonologist says that the palliative radiation treatment to try to open the airway is a Hail Mary, in his opinion, would most likely not work. Then he goes on to say if he is right, and this is pneumonia, it's much more treatable and can certainly give the immunotherapy a chance to work. Is that what you're referring to? That's the text I was talking about that came when uh, when talking to Jeannie Seconder. Okay. And the... Um, and this wasn't a terminal diagnosis on the 7th, was it? Not on the 7th. That was actually a, a, a little bit of positive news. Okay. That was short-lived, but it was positive at the time. You can take that down for now, Doug. The, um, But stay on that exhibit. Um, now, you, you were asking, if you'll go to page 46, please, um, the same exhibit, 520. Page 46. And uh, if you'll highlight and blow out the 902.18, Alec Murdoch's iPhone shows Now, Alec, do you remember being asked about these uh, steps, 283 steps traveled during this period of time? I do. And and I think you testified you, your belief was you're just getting ready to leave to go to your mom's house. Is that right? That's correct. I mean, that would have been the time I was right before I left to go there. And you were, looks like you had made some phone calls. Um, during this period of time, correct? Yes, the record show. Alec, did you have Maggie's phone with you at any time between 9.02 and 9.06? I didn't have Maggie's phone with me any time that night. And Doug, if you'll go to page 45, please. If you go to the entry at 853.15 to 855.32. What am I missing? Can you... Um, can you go? You're missing it. Go, go up one more entry, please. The one that no, the one that records steps, please. And then take take it all the way to the bottom. Done. Thank you. This is in evidence. And this is uh, Agent Rudowski's uh, timeline. It says Maggie Murdoch's phone. Um, iPhone shows 59 steps traveled between 853.15 and 855.32. Were you walking with Maggie Murdoch's phone during that period of time? I wasn't walking with Maggie's phone any time that night. And if you look at Agent Rudowski's uh, entries, is there entry of her phone showing steps during any time between 9.02 and 9.06? Do you see any on this page? from 8.53 to 8.55. No, sir. If you'll turn the next page, page 46. Going down to, to your steps, is there any recording of phone steps, phone recording steps, recording 
to the data we now have for Maggie's phone at any point in time up to 902? No, sir. And had you repeatedly asked SLED to get the, the data from the OnStar, from the cell phones, to evaluate whether your phone and Maggie's phone, Maggie's phone were ever moving at the same time. You made that multiple requests. I repeatedly asked David Owens about that information. And when you asked that question, were, were you aware that Maggie's phone had been located, you know, down the road, a mile, or, I mean, half a mile or more? Is that right? Yeah, I knew where her phone had been located. And why was it why was it important to you to get that information? Because I, I knew that whoever had done this to them had Maggie's phone. And I knew that my phone and Maggie's phone and my car were never together. At any point in time. Sure. Now, you have um, given inaccurate times in many statements to law enforcement in this case, have you not? I did. And um, we reviewed some of those in your direct examination. I mean, one was Paul getting to Moselle around 5 p.m. Do you remember that? I do. Were you lying to... Agent Owens or anybody when you said Paul was, got there at 5 p.m.? No, I, I wasn't lying to him. I mean, I, I thought that at the time. And when you... Um, and most of the times, when, or a lot of the times when I gave times, I qualified them and say, but, you know, you can look at this. I pointed them to my office, to the call log, like, uh, to the key card like we talked about, or my phone, or my own star. And when you... Um, told the agents that you thought you got to the office at 8 30 9 o'clock on that morning of june 7th well you were wrong right i was wrong were you lying no i wasn't lying okay. and when deputy green drove up and first you had your first encounter with him i believe you told him that you had been gone to your mom's house for hour an hour and a half is that right we just we just heard it the 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 last one yes sir uh, yeah hour and a half i think i think that is what i told uh, him hour and a half and that the last time you saw maggie and paul was 45 minutes before that yeah that's what i said and when you spoke to um agent green I mean, Deputy Green, it was about, I, th I think the record show they didn't arrive on the scene until 10.22 or something like that. Is that right? That, that sounds right. I mean, I think that's what the record show. Right. That sounds right. And that um, were you lying to Agent, excuse me, Deputy Green when, when you told him what time, how long you thought you'd been at your mother's and the last time you saw Maggie and Paul? No, sir. I wasn't lying to him. Were you trying to mislead him in any way? No, sir. Not when Mr. Green got there. Now, you've admitted in the first few questions that I asked you yesterday and multiple times today that, that that you lied to Agent Owen and Deputy Rutland and Agent Owen and Agent Croft and on a couple occasions about your whereabouts following dinner, correct? I did lie to them, as we discussed and, and, repeatedly. And you, you've explained that it, it was this addiction, opioid-induced par paranoia you just couldn't shake. Is that right? That's right. You know, like I said, there's certain things, anything, that make you paranoid, but I could get over it really quickly. But that night, I didn't. And you had a bag of pills in your pocket, did you not? I did. And 
When, when you got down to the kennels, we're not going to repeat all that, but I mean, did you ever see anybody down there, anybody else? No, there was nobody. There wasn't anybody down there when I was there. And did you believe that the information, whether you were there or not there, would in advance their investigation in any, any way? No, I didn't. I, I didn't think that. And why didn't you think that? Because they were fine and doing good when I left there. Did, um, on the, the 911 call, uh, do you remember that the call first went to Hampton? I don't remember that, but I, I, I know that now. And, and, and what we played here in the court in your testimony was the Colleton County handoff. Do you recall that? I, I do recall that. Okay. I think at some point the part in Hampton might have gotten played too, didn't it? But I, I know the main part was the call of them right. part. But it was like a, a minute into the call. But in, but initially it went to Hampton, and then subsequently it was transferred to Colleton. That's right. And then a minute or so into the Colleton call, you said, I've been up to it now. Do you remember that? I do remember saying that. I remember hearing it. I don't remember saying that, but I remember hearing it. Okay. And that's, I mean, that, that, that is accurate. And by up to it at that point, I had gone all the way up to them at that point. When I first got out, I was close, but I wasn't right at them, I don't think. Right. You were asked about the roadside shooting, and and your intent was to end your life that day, was it not? It was, no question. And, and you were shot but not killed, and then you made up a lie to law enforcement about what happened, right? That's correct. Were you trying to protect Curtis Eddie Smith by doing that? Was I trying to protect Curtis Eddie Smith? Yes. Uh, I mean, I, I, I don't know exactly. It, it all had to come together so quick. I don't know that I was trying to protect Curtis Eddie Smith. Um, okay. I, I may have been, but it, it, it was just, you know, I wasn't supposed to be there. And then I was. When you say I wasn't supposed to be there, what, what do you mean by that? I intended for him to, I mean, I, I intended to be gone. I intended for him to shoot me, and I intended to be gone. And, and the, the one thing, the, the, the main, my main concern at that point was that I did not want Buster, I did not want Buster knowing that I had tried to do that. That was my motivation in telling that story. I see. Did you eventually voluntarily convey to Agent Kelly and others that that was a fabrication? I did. I did. After, I don't know, a few days in, um, in detox when I finally got over those initial, just where I could function, I think I told you first, then I think I told Buster, then I think I told Randy and John, and y'all arranged either the next day or two days later to come, and we called Ryan Kelly. Well, you've, you've lied to your family over many years, have you not? I lied to my family about my addiction. And you hid from them you were stealing client money, did you not? Oh, I never. They, they didn't know anything about that. 
And you've, you've lied to your law partners about financial dealings and perhaps your addiction? Y yes. And you've lied to law enforcement about um, not going down to the kennels after dinner, but eating dinner and taking a nap. Did you not? I did. Alec, did you murder Maggie? I would never hurt Maggie. Did you murder Paul? I would never hurt Paul. If I was under the pressure that they're talking about here, I can promise you I would hurt myself before I would hurt one of them. Without a doubt. Thank you. That's all the questions I have. Orders. Hey, please, court. You said that you were concerned when you talked to David Owen about the bag of pills in your pocket, correct? I mean, no, sir. I don't. I'm, I'm not saying that I was concerned about that. I, I, I don't think I told you I was concerned about that. I'm just telling you that was that was a fact. I had a bag of pills in my pocket, and that was one of the things, that, that was one of the many things that came together that night. And you're trying to tell this jury that as a reasonable husband and father in this situation, concern about a bag of pills in your pocket was more important to you than telling law enforcement and narrowing the time when you last saw your wife and son alive. That's what you want to convince this jury of? No, sir, because, I mean, the, the bag of pills in my pocket was not what I was concerned about sitting in there. It was, as I said, it was one of the many things that was going on. But I wasn't sitting there worried about those pills in my pocket. You were asked about requesting the phone and automobile data. And that was because as a prosecutor and a lawyer, you had been manufacturing an alibi to cover your tracks. No, sir, that's absolutely wrong. You admit you were wrong about a lot of things in what you told law enforcement about June 7th, correct? I was, I was wrong about things. Some things. You were asked whether or not you voluntarily confessed to Agent Kelly but you only did so after being confronted with undeniable information, correct? No, sir. That's, that's not correct at all. What I was told is that, um, and I believe this came from Randy, what I was told is that SLED had come up with some information um, that seemed like it was consistent with my story and they needed me to verify some things is what they told me. And, you know, I knew that resources had already been wasted. Uh, I didn't want them wasting any more resources. And I told them the truth. But th there wasn't any, nobody had presented me with any evidence. And you just testified that you told Jim Griffin first, correct? I believe that I told Jim Griffin first. But at that time, you didn't say anything about those kennels, did you? To Jim Griffin at that right. time? No, sir. I didn't. When you testified on direct yesterday and you were asked about leaving the kennels with your 
new story in light of the evidence that's been presented in this trial. Your words were, I got out of there, correct? I, I believe that's what I said, yes, sir. And you also said during your testimony on cross-examination that you hurt the ones you love the most, didn't you? I did say that. Thank you. Nothing further. In, in saying that, Mr. Waters, I just want to explain that answer. I mean, he just asked me a question about what I, what I said, and I was going to explain why I said it. All right. As I told you earlier, you're implying to this jury and to me that that was me talking about hurting Maggie and Paul. And that's not what that was. What that was is me saying, I know I hurt my brother, my partners, my clients, many of whom I told you I loved, all of whom I cared for. And that's what that was when I'm talking about how my misdeeds, how I hurt the people worst were the ones I loved the most. I just asked you what you said, correct, Mr. Murdoch? You did ask me what I said, but in asking me that, you're, you're putting an implication on there that I am explaining. I just asked you what you said. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Nothing further. I'll stand for a moment while council approach. City, please. <laughs> well, we've come to the end of this week, and we will adjourn now and resume at 9.30 Monday morning. Have a great weekend. Do not discuss the case or... Allow yourself to be exposed to any information concerning the case. And we'll see you Monday morning. Have a great weekend. Jury's excuse. please. Uh, regarding scheduling, uh, first up Monday morning, Mr. Carpoolian. Uh, Your Honor, we anticipate um, having four witnesses on Monday. Um, they would probably average an hour apiece. So I would suspect by, by lunchtime we would be, no? 
early afternoon. Early afternoon, I'm told by Mr. Griffin, um, resting um, our case. And of course, uh, Mr. Waters indicated he'll have one or two reply witnesses. A couple right now, Your Honor. Obviously, we need to assess that when they complete their case, but it would not be lengthy. So that begs the question what day next week do we do uh, argument charge? Well, it's all unpredictable. Uh, <laughs> as we can see from today, it's uh, yes, pretty well, unpredictable. I'm, I'm guessing. I would, I'd hope Tuesday. I don't think that's going to be if they have any reply witnesses. Wednesday would be more of a target. I'm just saying a target date um, that we can begin thinking about um, in terms of uh, argument charge. To that end, are you going to set a time limit on arguments, or are you going to just let us do whatever we want? I do not set time limits on argument. With that in mind, Mr. Griffin and I, I mean, they get two arguments. We perhaps would like to split our final argument, um, which would we think with four weeks of testimony in there, it's going to be difficult for one person to digest all of that. There's no problem with that, is there? I would object to that. I think uh, Your Honor's rules and general practices are consistent with one counsel handling argument. Your, Your Honor, I've seen it done uh, both ways, and the four weeks of testimony, um, I think it's very difficult for one person, and we only get one argument. I've never done it, and I'm not inclined to do it. I'll look it over and consider it, but I'm not inclined to allow the uh, defense to split closing arguments. We would agree to a two-hour limit. Does that maybe incentivize um, to, to look at this? We'll look at it. I'm not inclined to do it. Um, it's unprecedented, as far as I know, in the state of South Carolina. I've Except perhaps where you've been able to convince someone to the contrary. I actually objected to it when I was on his side of the, uh, the, the courtroom. Well, we, we have some days to think about that. Yes, sir. Um, regarding closing arguments, uh, I think we emailed you all a few days ago concerning any requested charge or charges that you might have. Yes, sir. We'll get those to you uh, this weekend if that's acceptable. We'll try to do that, Your Honor, but we're preparing witnesses. Um, would, how about Monday night? That's fine. Okay. Anything else before we adjourn? Nothing from the State, Your Honor. Nothing from the Defense, Your Honor. Okay, 449. We are adjourning for the weekend.